merayakan hari jadinya ke-53, Lembaga Ilmu Pengetahuan Indonesia mempersembahkan rekam jejak yang ditorehkan dalam Kaleidoskop LIPI 2019-2020. LIPI memberikan apresiasi kepada para peneliti Indonesia yang memiliki dedikasi tinggi dan telah bekerja keras dalam menghasilkan karya penelitian yang luar biasa. Para peneliti LIPI pun turut menorehkan segudang prestasi di negeri sendiri maupun kancah internasional. Mempertahankan prestasi yang sudah diraih dan meraih prestasi membanggakan lainnya membuktikan bahwa LIPI konsisten dan terus berusaha sebaik mungkin dalam melakukan penelitian yang hasilnya dapat bermanfaat bagi masyarakat. Indonesia negeri yang kaya dalam keanekaragaman hayatinya. Namun, keanekaragaman hayati itu belum terungkap seluruhnya. Masih banyak keindahan flora dan keragaman fauna yang masih tersembunyi di balik tirai indah alam Indonesia. Para peneliti LIPI merekam temuan baru berbagai flora fauna di seluruh Indonesia. LIPI ada untuk masyarakat. Oleh karena itu, LIPI berusaha selalu mendekatkan diri pada masyarakat, menyebarluaskan hasil penelitian yang telah dilakukan pada masyarakat, dan meningkatkan kinerja menjadi lebih baik untuk meningkatkan bakti pada negeri. Dalam masa pandemi COVID-19 saat ini, LIPI terus melakukan berbagai macam riset untuk mendukung secara nyata percepatan penanganan COVID-19. 
Tidak hanya melakukan riset dalam bentuk kajian dan produk, LIPI juga mengembangkan pelatihan untuk pemenuhan SDM terlatih. Berbagai macam prestasi telah Lipi torehkan, melakukan riset yang secara nyata menghasilkan kebermanfaatan bagi masyarakat Indonesia. Tidak berpuas diri, Lipi akan terus melakukan berbagai riset dan menorehkan berbagai prestasi untuk negeri kita tercinta, Indonesia. Sampai jumpa di Kaleidoskop tahun 2020-2021. Diawali dengan kegemaran pemerintah kolonial Belanda dalam mengembangkan ilmu tumbuh-tumbuhan, tahun 1842 terkumpul 25 buku yang dibeli oleh Justus Karl Haska, seorang ahli botani yang menjadi cikal bakal berdirinya perpustakaan Kebun Raya Bogor. Koleksi meluas tahun 1887 saat Melchior Troop menjabat Direktur KRI atau Kebun Raya Indonesia. Beliau berhasil menerbitkan sebuah katalog yang memuat kurang lebih 4.000 artikel. Fungsi perpustakaan saat itu menyediakan literatur terutama dalam bidang botani kepada para peneliti tamu. Dari rangkaian sejarah di atas, pada tanggal 1 Juni 1965, berdirilah Pusat Dokumentasi Ilmiah Nasional atau PDIN. Kemudian pada perjalanannya, PDIN mengalami perubahan struktur organisasi pada 13 Januari 1986 menjadi PDII LIPI. Lalu, berubah menjadi Pusat Data dan Dokumentasi Ilmiah atau PDDI tahun 2019 yang mempunyai tugas melaksanakan pengelolaan data, informasi, dan dokumentasi ilmiah dan non-ilmiah. Selain itu, memiliki fungsi penyusunan kebijakan teknis, rencana, dan program pengelolaan data, informasi, dan dokumentasi ilmiah dan non-ilmiah. Pengelolaan infrastruktur dan sistem informasi, pengelolaan repositori, pengelolaan depositori, pemantauan, evaluasi dan pelaporan, dan pelaksanaan urusan tata usaha. Untuk perpustakaan kawasan, itu memang merupakan salah satu dari perubahan proses di bisnis di reorganisasi LIPI tahap pertama yang dimulai tahun 2019, awal tahun ya. Dan ini tujuannya jelas, reorganisasi tentunya adalah untuk lebih lincah, mempercepat layanan, dan kemudian juga adanya efisiensi dan efektivitas. Efisiensi di sini adalah untuk efisiensi anggaran, efektivitas yaitu dengan menyatukan SDM-SDM dengan fungsional yang sama melakukan tugas dan layanan. Nah itu yang mendasari sehingga diharapkan perubahan proses bisnis dari kawasan yang ada di Satker itu memang polanya adalah di kawasan sehingga skop yang di lakukan itu memang lebih luas cakupannya kemudian juga adanya interaksi antara para pejabat fungsional eh, perpustakaan 
Dan yang ketiga tentunya kita ingin perubahan proses bisnis di penyatuan perpustakaan kawasan adalah perubahan layanan yang tadinya pustak, perpustakaan itu lebih ke layanan eksternal kita sering lupa bahwa sekarang ini kita harus memprioritaskan juga pentingnya database center ya di mana PDDI sudah harus melakukan fungsi sebagai pusat data informasinya yang dilakukan hasil hasil riset TV tidak hanya hasil riset justru data-data capaian korporat itu harus menjadi tugas dan fungsi dari perpustakaan di perpustakaan kawasan. PDDI LIPI memiliki lima kepustakaan, yaitu Kepustakaan Kawasan Jakarta, Serpong, Cibinong, Bogor, dan Bandung. Tiap kepustakaan memiliki koleksi buku, jurnal, laporan eksplorasi, skripsi, tesis baik itu tercetak maupun digital sesuai dengan disiplin ilmu pengetahuan dan penelitian di LIPI. Mikrofis juga melengkapi ragam koleksi yang hanya terdapat di Kepustakaan Kawasan Jakarta. Kepustakaan Kawasan Jakarta merupakan gabungan dari Perpustakaan PDDI, Perpustakaan Pusat Penelitian Oseanografi, dan Perpustakaan Kedeputian Bidang Ilmu Pengetahuan Sosial dan Kemanusiaan atau IPSK difokuskan pada dua bidang ilmu pengetahuan yaitu ilmu sosial dan kemanusiaan dan ilmu kelautan. Kepustakaan Kawasan Serpong memiliki koleksi bidang rekayasa dan informasi standar teknis seperti ASTM, JIS, ISO, SAE. Pustakawan akan bekerja sama dengan perpustakaan lain seperti BSN, Trisindo, maupun penyedia informasi standar teknis di seluruh dunia. Kepustakaan Kawasan Cibinong Lipi merupakan gabungan dari Perpustakaan Pusat Penelitian Biologi, Pusat Penelitian Bioteknologi, Pusat Penelitian Biomaterial, dan Pusat Penelitian Limnologi. Memiliki koleksi keanekaragaman hayati, bioteknologi, biomaterial, dan perairan darat atau sistem informasi danau. Kepustakaan Kawasan Bogor, Cibinong, dan Jakarta memiliki koleksi antikuariat yang merupakan referensi bagi para peneliti dari zaman dahulu hingga sekarang dengan bidang penelitian konservasi, perkebun rayaan, botani, zoologi, dan oseanografi. Terakhir, Kepustakaan Kawasan Bandung mengelola koleksi-koleksi satuan kerja Pusat Penelitian Teknik dan Kebumian. Keunikan dari Kepustakaan Kawasan Bandung ini adalah jenis koleksi yang dikelolanya dalam bentuk multimedia, seperti film iptek, animasi, dan ebook tiga dimensi. Selain itu, terdapat ruang sinema yang bisa dimanfaatkan untuk menonton maupun berdiskusi terkait film yang diputar. Era industri 4.0 mulai masuk dalam pengelolaan perpustakaan. Tantangan yang dihadapi oleh perpustakaan dan pustakawan diantaranya interkoneksi, kolaborasi, layanan berbasis IoT atau Internet of Things, dan Big Data. Dalam rangka menuju visi dan misi BDI yaitu menjadi repository ilmiah nasional, maka kami menawarkan kepada seluruh sivitas LIPI, termasuk peneliti maupun litbang seluruh Indonesia untuk mempreservasi data penelitiannya. Dan kami di LIPI dengan repository ilmiah nasional atau kita singkat menjadi RIN, bersedia atau mampu melayani deposit data dan karya ilmiah itu. Ya, tentu saja hak kekayaan intelektual peneliti juga kita lindungi sehingga data itu tidak begitu saja harus terbuka. Ada proses supaya data itu disimpan sampai pada tahap terbuka bisa diakses dan bisa digunakan kembali oleh peneliti atau kegiatan penelitian lainnya. Dengan hal ini maka kolaborasi penelitian bisa kita tingkatkan karena peneliti lain yang mungkin memiliki topik penelitian yang sama memerlukan data itu sehingga peneliti ini tidak perlu mengambil data yang sama cukup melengkapi data yang baru dengan hal ini maka peneliti baru ini dengan peneliti lama bisa kolaborasi itu yang pertama yang kedua data penelitian yang merupakan hak kekayaan intelektual kita 
akan tersimpan selamanya. Lipi siap menampung sebesar apapun data penelitian yang uh, dihasilkan oleh peneliti. Kondisi sekarang uh, di infrastruktur Lipi kita sudah punya 5 peta byte untuk data penelitian dan mudah-mudahan akhir tahun kita bisa punya, punya sampai 12 peta, peta byte dan itu akan terus kita tingkatkan untuk melayani penyimpanan dan preservasi data penelitian se-Indonesia. Untuk menghadapi era industri 4.0 dilakukan dengan peningkatan kapasitas kemampuan pustakawan yang memicu berbagai ide kreatif, inovatif, kolaboratif, adaptif, dan berintegritas. Di antaranya, 1. Tersertifikasi 2. Mampu mengelola data ilmiah atau repositori ilmiah nasional 3. Mampu beradaptasi dengan perkembangan teknologi informasi terkini 4. Mengembangkan sistem integrasi kepustakaan LIPI Kepustakaan LIPI bekerja berlandaskan nilai LIPI Integritas, ilmiah, unggul guna mendukung program pemerintah dalam menciptakan SDM unggul untuk Indonesia maju. Saat ini, kegiatan penelitian di berbagai bidang memiliki tingkat ketergantungan yang tinggi terhadap data-data penelitian. Kemajuan yang sangat tinggi dalam kegiatan eksperimen yang didukung oleh teknologi komputasi telah mendorong kegiatan menggunakan dan menghasilkan data dalam volume, variasi, dan kecepatan yang sangat tinggi. Dalam era open science, data penelitian yang dihasilkan memungkinkan untuk diakses oleh peneliti lainnya sehingga mereka dapat meningkatkan integritas dan kredibilitasnya. Kondisi penyimpanan data penelitian di Indonesia saat ini masih dilakukan secara terpisah di masing-masing institusi dan dilakukan oleh peneliti secara individual, sehingga cukup sulit bagi pemangku kepentingan di bidang riset untuk melihat sejauh mana perkembangan kegiatan riset berdasarkan data penelitian yang dimiliki dalam skala nasional. Terlebih lagi, Repositori institusi sebagai wadah penyimpanan aset pengetahuan saat ini baru dimanfaatkan sebatas menyimpan karya atau publikasi ilmiah. Di negara maju yang telah berkembang kegiatan risetnya, negara memiliki tanggung jawab dalam melakukan pengelolaan data penelitian melalui repositori nasional seperti Australia dengan ENS, Inggris dengan UK Data Service, serta Belanda dengan DANS. Pengelolaan data penelitian dengan menyimpan pada media tertentu seperti komputer, laptop, atau eksternal hard disk kurang dapat diandalkan dan beresiko untuk rusak. Selain itu, ada resiko lain yang tak kalah berbahaya, yakni hilangnya media karena pencurian. Di mana hal ini sangatlah disayangkan, mengingat data tersebut adalah hasil kerja keras selama bertahun-tahun. Oleh karena itu, penyimpanan pada repositori institusi menjadi solusi yang paling ideal. Perilaku peneliti dalam melakukan penyimpanan data penelitian sangat bervariasi. Dalam kajian yang dilakukan oleh tim PDII LIPI, bahwa selama ini peneliti melakukan penyimpanan paling banyak pada media laptop atau personal komputer dan berbagai penyimpanan eksternal. Kondisi ini diperparah dengan backup data yang dilakukan semaunya. Dalam melakukan penelitian, seorang peneliti idealnya sudah memiliki satu perencanaan manajemen data. Banyak sekali manfaat yang akan diperoleh peneliti, institusi, maupun negara ketika bisa menerapkan manajemen data penelitian dengan ideal, yakni efisiensi. Ketersediaan data pada repositori nasional akan mengurangi kegiatan penelitian yang serupa. Safety. Berbagai resiko kehilangan data yang disebabkan oleh perangkat penyimpanan dapat diminimalisir dan juga merupakan upaya untuk melindungi hak kekayaan intelektual. Quality. Repositori akan membantu peneliti untuk menjaga kualitas data dan proses kurasi memungkinkan data penelitian terpelihara sehingga dapat digunakan kembali. Reputation 
seorang peneliti akan meningkat reputasinya saat datanya digunakan kembali oleh peneliti lainnya. Compliance Kewajiban menyimpan data yang ditetapkan penyandang dana penelitian dapat diakomodir melalui repositori institusi. Pentingnya mendepositkan dan membagikan data jika dilakukan oleh peneliti terbagi menjadi tiga keuntungan. Bagi peneliti, dapat meningkatkan reputasi dan visibilitas penelitian individu. Bagi komunitas ilmiah, dapat meningkatkan kolaborasi. Dan bagi masyarakat, mereka akan mendapatkan akses yang lebih mudah ke dunia penelitian. LIPI, melalui Pusat Data dan Dokumentasi Ilmiah atau PDDI, menginisiasi kegiatan pengelolaan data penelitian melalui sistem penyimpanan data penelitian dengan nama Repositori Ilmiah Nasional atau disingkat RIN. Dengan kapasitas yang tak terbatas, RIN mampu menyimpan dan berbagi data penelitian seluruh peneliti. RIN mampu berkontribusi dalam pemetaan perkembangan dunia penelitian. RIN, kunci kemajuan IPTEK Indonesia. Merayakan Hari Jaya. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We delighted to welcome you again to the second day of the third International Conference and Documentation and Information Future of Indonesian Research, Debt Management and Open Science. This event is hosted by PDDI LIPI, Indonesian Institute of Sciences, in collaboration with ECPE, Association of Indonesian Library and Information Professionals, and supported by KITLP and Goethe Institute. We believe that all of us have already got extensive insights from the presentation delivered by keynote speakers in the first day of conference yesterday. And for today, we hope that all participants will continue for gathering new information and knowledge regarding open science and its roles, policies, and citizen science. As soon as the first day of conference yesterday, we were also running the conference in two sessions. First session will be the presentation from our honorable keynote speakers. We are welcoming greetings for Alison Behling from USMC. Hi, Alison Behling. Greetings, selamat pagi. Selamat pagi, Alison. How do you do? All is fine, we hope everyone is safe and healthy today. Also, Absolutely. Dr. Matthias from Cake House. Mm -hmm. Hello, Dr. Matthias. And also, Kurt the Builder from Leiden University. And this session will be led by our moderator, Dr. Sanderson Oni. Selamat pagi, Dr. Sanderson Oni. Selamat pagi, Mbak. Apa kabar? Alhamdulillah, baik-baik, Dr. Sanderson Oni. Semoga semua sehat-sehat pagi ini. We are continuing with the second session will be the presentation from our speakers joining call for papers and will also make the parallel call for paper session in room A and room B. The committee will then display the address for, for the call for paper session. For a brief moment, let's state our fully grateful that during this pandemic situation, we could all gather here with a safe and healthy condition. And before we start our conference today, I would like to remind you again that during the events for this conference, there will be some rules applied to follow the conference. The first one is for all the attendees, for all the attendees, we are expect you to use the device that meet the requirement for using the Zoom application. So the event will run smoothly. 
For the attendee who will participate in the Zoom, required to use the ID that states their full name and affiliation. Please only use the name you have used in the registration. And please use the same name for any online survey or questionnaire delivered to you. This, this event is on webinar setup, so there's only panelists are able to make audiovisual communication. If attendee want to ask something, you can notify the committee using the Q&A feature and just raise your hand. You could also join in the event from our YouTube channel on Lippy channel. Attendees are not allowed to write opinions or information that are offensive, racist, or immoral in nature. The committee has the full right to block and remove attendees from Zoom webinar or YouTube live who violate the rules previously mentioned. E-certificates will be given to attendees who have filled the attendance register and online survey provided by the committee. E-certificates and any slides will be delivered to participants email for maximum 14 days after the webinar. This webinar recording will be made available for general viewing on Lippy YouTube channel. We are now approaching the first session for today and again we are kindly remind you to always use the same name with your name and registration during the event and please also responding to our questionnaire since this is the requirement for you to receive the event certificate now we are going to have the presentation from our honorable keynote speakers. And before that, I'd like to inform you about our moderator curriculum vitae. Our moderator is Dr. Sander Santoni. He is a postdoctoral researcher. He is a postdoctoral researcher at the Black Dog Institute, UNSW Sydney, while his main focus is global mental health and suicide prevention. He has ever co cooperation led, co led, and moderated the Indonesian webinar in 2019 with over a thousand academics from 30 institutions and funded by the Southeast Asian Network for Open Science. Now, Dr. Sanjusan Oni, time is yours. Thank you very, very much, Ma. Um, good morning, everyone. And I'm very, very excited for today. And so because of many things, I think Indonesia's research is moving forward. And of course, I think we know that if we want to grow, then we have to learn to be open. There's this one slogan that some of my respected colleagues would use. It's like either we're open or we're left behind. And so I'm very, very excited to be taking part in this event today. And it is my incredible honor to introduce our very first keynote speaker, Alison Bailing. So, Alison. Alison berasal dari Morgantown, Virginia Barat, dan saat ini menjadi Technology Officer di Economic Stations Envir Environment Science Technology and Health, yaitu ESTH unit at the U.S. Embassy in Jakarta. Sejak dia ikut dalam role ini di 2010, dia sempat di U.S. Embassy di Guangzhou, Berlin, dan Warsaw. Di Warsaw, Alison atau yang digemar dipanggil ala, dia, meng, dia menutupi banyak isu termasuk air quality, cybersecurity, health policy, entrepreneurship, 
women in STEM, space innovation, climate policy, which is an incredible list. <laughs> and Ella has earned State Department Meritious Honor Awards for her work in advancing U.S. government interest, the Dalam South Crisis Ebola, promotion of innovative technologies, and climate policy. So we're going to start in a few minutes, but I just want to say, hi, Ella, how are you doing today? Doing great. Terima kasih banyak. Uh, Mas Oni, and thank you so much to Lipi and everybody for the opportunity to be here. Wonderful, that's absolutely wonderful. And so, hanya um, sedikit pengumuman untuk peserta pada hari ini. Kita akan menggunakan function, question, dan answer. Jadi jika ada pertanyaan silakan ditaruh. Dan hari ini uh, kita punya format akan sedikit berbeda. Jadi sebelum kita masuk ke bahan kita, um, saya mau kasih tahu sebentar. Pertama. Akan ada dua presentasi, lalu kita akan diskusi. Karena kan salah satu panelisnya itu ada perbedaan jam sedikit. Lalu lanjut ke sesi ketiga dan ada question and answer lagi. Jadi kita ada panelis, panelis, diskusi, panelis dan ada diskusi terakhir. Dan kalau misalnya ada pertanyaan dalam bahasa Indonesia, um, jangan takut silakan taruh dalam bahasa Indonesia, maka saya akan translate. Dan dalam setelah setiap sesi tersebut saya akan berusaha untuk translate bahasa kembali dalam bahasa Indonesia. Um, but otherwise, uh, we're going to start very, very soon. And are you ready to start, Ala? Sure thing. No Absolutely. Worries. And, and Mas Cha, uh, Chayo is going to help with the PowerPoint, correct? Absolutely, Mas Chayo. Yeah, siap. Sit. No worries. The floor is yours. Oh, terima kasih banyak. Um, fantastic. Here it comes on the screen. Great. Um, again, thank you very much uh, to everyone at LIPI for the opportunity to participate today on behalf of the U.S. Embassy Jakarta. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Thank you to the fellow speakers and presenters as well, both who participated yesterday as well as those who will take part and present today. Thank you to Mas Oni. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing uh, Mr. De Belder and Dr. Premke Kraus uh, later on. And I also wanted to take a moment and express uh, some thanks and some recognition to uh, from our Library of Congress field office in Jakarta here at the US Embassy. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Carol Mitchell, has worked very closely with the Badan Pusat Statistik, uh, who, uh, who has established um, a number of desks and other uh, services to help meet customer and researcher needs. So many thanks to Badan Pusat Statistik. Uh, Lipi and Ristek in, in general also have done a great job in making scholarly journals available. Uh, through journal databases and other means. So exactly the kind of uh, cooperation that is needed to promote more open science as is, uh, as is one of our key topics here today. So terima kasih banyak. Um, and in general, ASEAN has been working to standardize data collection and make open science and open data more accessible and beneficial for researchers across the region. And Indonesia has really been at the forefront, serving as a model for other countries in the nation. So way to go, Indonesia, on that front. Great. Next, please. So I'll start today with a few words from the highest ranking executive branch official in the US government who is a representative on behalf of and who is responsible for science and technology policy. So when it comes to crowdsourcing and citizen science in the United States, uh, looking for new innovative ways to encourage and promote more direct participation from volunteers and more use of open data, um, these words come from the White House and from Dr. Kelvin Drogemeyer. 
It's a long quote, but I have it written here, so perhaps you can return to it later on if you don't pick it all up now. But I'll go ahead and read it through because I think it's a good summary of the importance that the US government places on citizen science. And that is, quote, America has always been a nation of thinkers, doers, and problem solvers. By encouraging everyday Americans to engage in scientific research, our citizen science authorities benefit communities and the country as a whole, as well as advance our science and technology enterprise. Our government has a commitment to unleash federal resources, to strengthen partnerships inside and outside of government, and to encourage citizens to tackle great scientific challenges." End quote. So I think this is a great uh, statement to kind of start the conversation on today in terms of looking at how the United States government commits uh, efforts, funding, uh, research materials, and creates policies that enable our technical agencies and departments across the government to work better with and innovate with citizens around the globe. Next, please. So there is a, a long colorful history of different kinds of crowdsourcing and citizen science that have taken place in the United States. Uh, it goes back um, as far as, and in fact, probably before uh, written, um, written knowledge of and reporting of our founding fathers and, and mothers in the United States. For example, our third president, Thomas Jefferson, was a well-known, eager and enthusiastic uh, amateur scientist of his day. And President Jefferson collected weather observations in the state of Virginia and around his, his property and had plans to build one day a weather network across the region that would provide updates of temperature and wind speed and direction twice a day. Now, thinking back to the late 1700s, that's pretty amazing. That's pretty ahead of his time uh, for the 18th century. Benjamin Franklin was also uh, a very well-known amateur scientist. And his experiments and the data and outcomes that he shared from those experiments have gone on to, or went on to, to underpin a number of other key uh, discoveries. Fast forwarding a bit to President Theodore Roosevelt, who was uh, our first president of the 20th century. He was also a very avid naturalist who enjoyed spending lots of time in the natural beauty, in the outdoors, uh, which we are very fortunate to have much of in the United States, as of course is the case here in Indonesia. Um, and President Roosevelt was not only instrumental uh, in the establishment of our National Park Service uh, in 1916, so after his term, but he himself also kept close observations and records of birds in the White House and around Washington, DC for scientists to use later on. There are also examples of federal agencies and departments in our government incorporating citizen science into their mandates and into their activities going back for decades. And we'll hear more about both of the projects I list here our National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's National Weather Service Cooperative Observer Program, and our US Geological Survey's Did You Feel It project on the next slide. So next, please. Great. 
So on the left here, and I hope it's clear for, for viewers at home or wherever you're taking part today. On the left, we see a screenshot from the National Weather Service's Cooperative Obser Observer Program data. This program has been around since the year 1890 and volunteers across the country at all of these dots that you see take temperature and wind measurements and report that data directly to the National Weather Service to help use and to help improve our forecasting models. So this has been going on since 1890 when volunteers, especially in rural areas, would take those measurements and then send them by mail to the federal government offices. Today, of course, anybody can take part and upload that information much quicker via your mobile phone, right? So now we have even more participants uh, who are gathering and sharing data across the United States. On the right is a screenshot from the US Geological Survey's Did You Feel It project. And I wonder if you can kind of guess by looking at the screenshot, what kind of data this project focuses on. The US Gov uh, Geological Survey uses volunteer reports to supplement or add to their conventional sensor networks that are looking at earthquake activity, not only across the United States, but as you see here across the world. So this is a particular screenshot that I took yesterday afternoon that indicates all of the reports and volunteers who sent their data related to earthquake tremors up to the main uh, website in the last 24 hours. And it doesn't look on this slide as if anybody from Indonesia yesterday participated, but anybody who is interested and who feels a shock, because there's, there's plenty of examples of that here in Indonesia, you too, or they too, can take that information on their mobile phone and upload it to the US Geological Survey site, adding to that body of knowledge. Next, please. Okay, I apologize for this slide. It's a lot of text and no, no fi uh, pictures. And that's always a little <laughs> hard to get through. But I think it's important to understand current government efforts in the light of, in the United States, in the light of existing legal authority, existing policies that are the foundation of how our federal government continues to promote and build crowdsourcing and citizen science. So in particular, the relevant legislation goes back to the year 2010, but an update of that legislation in January 2017 in the form of the American Innovation and Competitiveness Act is really what we in the federal government base our current and future citizen science promotion efforts on. And that 2017 law has a particular section called the Crowdsourcing and Citizen, Sci uh, Citizen Science Act. Excuse me, I'm just also refreshing my notes here on the side. And the Crowdsourcing and Citizen Science Act, as you can see here, uh, gives federal agencies across the government broad authority to use both crowdsourcing of data, sharing of data, as well as other methods of citizen science to advance their missions, their work, and to help grow broader citizen and public participation in the scientific process that leads to innovations in all sorts of areas, right? And this law, the Crowdsourcing and uh, Citizen Science Act applies to 
federal agencies and departments across the entire government. So we're talking about uh, geological work. We are talking about national parks and the forest service. We are talking about agriculture and food security and safety. We're talking about weather and climate data, which includes air quality data and many more areas. It's also encompassing of health data, health and human services in many different forms. The January 2017 law also emphasizes that there are many public participation benefits to science, right? These include, as you can see here, and as is quoted in the act, accelerating scientific research, making cost effectiveness of research even better, because this means that taxpayer money as citizens, right, of the United States, that it is being used in federally run or federally mandated science in an even better way. This addresses societal needs, right, because with volunteers and with members of the public directly participating in scientific activities, those members of the public are helping to set priorities for scientists across the government. Public participation in science, as you all know, also provides many hands-on learning uh, opportunities in science, technology, engineering, and math. And overall, it's a great way to more directly connect members of the public to federal science agencies. And you can find more information about this act at the link below, the links below, excuse me, or by simply Googling crowdsourcing and citizen science act. All of this information is easily accessible and available on the internet. Speaking of open data and open science. Next, please. As was required by the 2017 Crowdsourcing and Citizen Science Act, the White House's Office of Science and Technology Policy published a report in 2019 summarizing crowdsourcing and citizen science projects, progress, and outcomes in the prior two fiscal years. This was the first such comprehensive federal government report that emphasized both the breadth of citizen science efforts across the federal government in every corner of our country, as well as the depth of their impact in communities around the country and in fact worldwide, as we'll see a few slides down the road. Again, if you're interested in reading part or all of this very long <laughs> report, please visit citizenscience.gov and you can easily access the report. Thank you. Next, please. Another outcome of the Citizen and Crowdsourcing Act has become the building of the citizenscience.gov website and portal. I've already uh, referred to this website a few times now. And if you're interested in taking a look at a catalog of federally supported citizen science projects, the toolkits, the great updated resources that are available to assist both federal officials to design projects, but as well community officials and scientists at universities. Or if you want to learn more about a community of hundreds of crowdsourcing and citizen science practitioners across the country, I highly encourage you to check out this website. It's very, I think it's laid out very well. It's user friendly. Each of the toolkit elements is easy to access. And even just browsing on the catalog page, as you see here in a screenshot, is so interesting 
you see that there are truly projects for every for every interest in science. There is something for a volunteer of any scope of uh, engagement to do, whether you as a volunteer want to get out directly into the forests or the watersheds or the city communities and gather data directly, or whether you prefer to sit at home and analyze photographs and other data that are provided online. Next, please. Really briefly, because I know that we're already half, more than halfway done with my time slot, I also want to highlight a few US government departments and agencies that have really fantastic crowdsourcing citizen science programs and that really uh, make the most use of open data and volunteer work. And again, if you are interested in any of these particular fields, I highly encourage you to check them out on, on the web. One of those US uh, government departments is the United States Forest Service. They have developed a series of very popular programs for volunteers across the country, uh, largely that involve getting out into nature, getting out into forest habitats to help catalog biodiversity and the changes in biodiversity over time, but also information and uh, programs that you can do from your own home. Some of the more popular ones are bird counts, where you can look out your window into your backyard and at a certain period of time every day or every week or every month, catalog the numbers and species of birds that you see. Next, please. Our United States National Park Service recently celebrated its 100th birthday. And as part of that celebration, the National Park Service developed a program called BioBlitz to help discover and document biodiversity in our national parks. And I wonder, could we uh, play the very brief video? Ready, get set, BioBlitz. National Geographic and the National Park Service invite you to participate in the 10th annual BioBlitz a challenge to identify and document as many species of animals and plants in your area as you can. BioBlitz events take place across the country during the month of May. Find one near you at natgeo.org slash BioBlitz. Thank you. Yes, our national park system uh, is um, really a national treasure. And this uh, program and others in which volunteers and local members of the community can directly engage so that we can better understand and protect these unique ecosystems is really so important. So I'm a big fan of BioBlitz in particular. Next, please. Oops. <laughs> We can watch it again later. <laughs> Great. This one is near and dear to my heart because both of my parents are geologists. So the United States Geological Survey, as I mentioned earlier, has their great uh, citizen science platform in which volunteers are encouraged to share uh, earthquake tremor information. The United States Geological Survey also runs the National Map online platform. And through the National Map, a group of volunteers will, success, uh, will successfully edit and upload updated information about what they actually see in their community. The idea is to provide the most accurate mapping data in all 50 states, as well as Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands, to include schools, hospitals, post offices, police, and other important buildings. And of course, this is important for many different reasons. 
not only for use every day by the general public, but also in particular uh, during emergencies, um, during moments of crisis, um, and other times when either the government and or uh, police forces or other rescue forces need to step in and act immediately. Next, please. Uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has perhaps um, uh, is one of the organizations in the federal government with uh, most, uh, most of the very active citizen science programs. Um, I've listed several by name here, and unfortunately, we don't have time to go into each of them in detail. But again, the breadth of topics of subject matter areas that are covered, including uh, weather phenomena, both current and historical, uh, including the protection of very sensitive marine habitats and animals in those marine habitats, endangered species, as well as urban heat island mapping. It's truly, uh, truly fascinating diversity. And there's something for everybody who is interested in becoming a citizen scientist with NOAA. Next, please. I'll finish up today by talking a bit more specifically about the State Department's role in promoting science, technology, and public, uh, public participation through citizen science around the world, right? Those are the kind of things that I do every day as a uh, science and technology officer at US Embassy Jakarta or in my prior postings. And it's what my colleagues here at the US Embassy Jakarta and at embassies and consulates around the world uh, work on to promote. You see here on this slide some information that you can find at the official website for the State Department, state.gov. It emphasizes the importance that not only the State Department, but also individual officers put on science, technology, and innovation promotion. In particular, State Department officials run public diplomacy programs around the world that promote the value of science. We also help to design and carry out capacity building programs to train young men and women to become science and technology entrepreneurs and the department as a whole, through many different fields and methods, helps to contribute to scientific efforts to accelerate economic growth and advance our foreign policy priorities. Next, please. So what does this mean concretely? Here are a few examples that for example, I've been uh, very fortunate and honored to help work on and to help promote as my, in my role as science and technology officer. There are a wide variety of speaker and exchange programs that United States, uh, the US State Department has designed, helps to fund in part and helps to carry out every year around the world. Now, of course, right now with the COVID-19 pandemic, unfortunately, there is very little, if any, direct travel going on uh, between the United States and other countries. Of course, we hope that that situation changes soon because there are fantastic opportunities to design exchange programs specifically tailored to the interests and needs of local communities. For example, here in Jakarta or across Indonesia, if we at the embassy meet and get to know a group of young Indonesian uh, scientists who are really eager 
about designing new uh, crowdsourcing and citizen science initiatives and connecting those in the most beneficial ways possible to government resources, we at the embassy can help design an exchange program in which those Indonesian participants can come to the United States for a few weeks to meet with crowdsourcing and citizen science experts across the country. Of course, we're very interested in best practices and capacity building events and sharing that goes both ways. Because of course, our US scientists and government officials have a lot to learn from partners around the globe as well. And one of the more interesting and creative examples of the State Department promoting crowdsourcing and citizen science abroad can be found through our various hackathons. Hackathons based on different topics that address key science and technology challenges that we all face. Right, so I, I imagine that most, if not all of you, are at least generally familiar with the idea of a hackathon, bringing together coders, scientists, designers, makers, and others to help develop open source solutions to problems such as illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing in our fish hackathon, or wildlife trafficking, like in our zoo hackathon. Next slide, please. And I'll finish up here with a fantastic success story from right here in Indonesia. In 2019, an Indonesian team called Team Navy Pangolin took second place in the, in the global zoo hackathon competition. So congrats to them. The team created an artificial intelligence powered tool to extract and verify data from online news articles to find information about wildlife seizures that will be necessary in better understanding and preventing wildlife crimes. And for their fantastic design, they will receive a $5,000 uh, value in compute credit grants from Microsoft Azure to keep going further. Congratulations again to Team Navy Pangolin. Last slide, please. So looking ahead, I am very interested to hear, uh, to hear what fellow presenters today have to share what topics Mas Oni and all of you uh, taking part from home would like to uh, talk more about. And I'd like to say once again, thank you very much for the opportunity to discuss these really important and timely issues with you today. Terima kasih banyak. Thank you so much, Alison. Let's give Alison a huge round of applause, everyone. That was incredibly <laughs> fascinating and I enjoyed the talk very, very much. We've already got a slew of questions, but as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we're going to be doing it after the next talk. Jadi sudah ada banyak pertanyaan yang luar biasa, kita akan tunggu setelah um, paparan yang selanjutnya. And that will also be a masuk. Um, one of the things, if you don't mind sharing, Alison, is that Alison just arrived in Indonesia very recently. So one of the other things that we can do after the discussion of the question and you can send Alison all the wonderful food recommendations around in the area. <laughs> yes, please, please, absolutely. Been here one week, so we have a lot to learn. <laughs> wonderful. Thank you so much, Alison. So moving on, we have another incredible speaker with us. Kita ada Dr. Matthias Premke Kraus. Dan Dr. Matthias Premke Kraus ini mendapatkan PhD-nya dari Alfred Wagner Institute, the Hellholtz Center for Polar and Marine Research in Bremerhaven, Germany, di tahun 2003. Dia saat ini adalah science manager di headquarters of the Leibniz Association di Berlin, Jerman, focusing on environmental science, biodiversity, sustainability, and citizen science. Sebelum itu, dia sudah pegang banyak posisi 
Contrary to the Scientific Coordinator of the Leibniz Research Alliance, Project Manager in the Institute of Landscape Ecology and Nature Conversation, Dissingen, Germany. So without further ado, Dr. Matthias, are you with us? Yes, thank you very much uh, uh, for the kind of introduction, Sanderson. Uh, good morning, everybody from Berlin. <laughs> uh, it's um, still darkness here outside, uh, if you can see, but um, uh, I hope um, that you can hear me well in Jakarta. Um, so please, uh, could you share, uh, should I show them, share my um, oh yeah. Okay. Great. So the team will be sharing. Would you like to okay. share your own slides, or would you like the team to do so? Yeah, um, the team shall please uh, share the slides, please. Okay. Uh, Masayo, thank thank you very much. Share the slide, yeah. Um, and great. Yeah, We're looking so forward to talk. And thank you so much for making the time so early in the morning <laughs> to talk to us here in Australia and Indonesia. Very much looking forward to this session. <laughs> Yes, Thank you. thanks a lot. Yes. yes, I'm very happy to be part of this exciting conference and that I can present um, how citizen science affects open science uh, from a view uh, from a Germany and European view. Um, I hope that I can answer this question at the end of my presentation. Um, after the exciting input from Alison, I want to draw your attention to citizen science policy activities in Germany. You will see that we have a very similar uh, experiences and projects in Germany and Europe too. In my presentation, I would like to focus especially on the strategy process in how we have in introduced the topic of citizen science in Germany. Um, next slide, please. Yes. Uh, uh, yes. Well, thank you. Um, at uh, and slide before, please. Yes. Thank you. Um, at the beginning, I would like to say something about the development of citizen science in Germany and Europe during the last years. Citizen science has a long tradition, as you know, but in the past, it was not so strongly rooted in science as a concept or method. Citizen science was largely limited to NGOs and uh, natural history societies. This has changed radically over the past decade. The reason for this is the rapid development of communication technologies, for example, web applications and apps. These technical achievements suddenly enabled an extremely high spatio-temporal resolution of data like never before. Today, citizen science is a mega topic and there is hardly a strategy and policy that does not integrate citizen science. There's also a series of lighthouse publications based on citizen science that have attracted a lot of attention, at least in Germany. I would like to give you an example. The so-called Krefeld study has shown that more than 75% of total flying insect biomass in protected areas in Germany de declined over 27 years. This study is essentially based on the work of citizen scientists. This had led to a great deal of public and political attention to the issue of biodiversity loss and has increased interest in science in general. The result, the result was that politicians felt compelled to adopt new campaigns and strategize. Our federal German Federal Ministry of research and education, the so-called BMBF, launched a new funding line for citizen science projects. The nature conditions 
study in Germany shows that such citizen science projects have led to an overall increase in interest in science. As you can see, um, almost 50% of Germans are interested in participating in a scientific research project. Next slide, slide please. This slide shows how in Germany and partly with the Austri Austrian and Swiss colleagues, the process of, for a citizen science strategy was systematically approached. The community was, has informed has formed a consortium led by scientists from non-university research and universities in um, Germany. In the BMBF, uh, the ministry-funded project, a strategy for Germany was developed over a period of three years in a participatory process. The goal was to develop op options for action to make citizen science as major movement by 2020. To this end, many workshops, surveys, uh, interviews, and online consultations were conducted with all uh, groups of society. The result is the 2016 Green Paper, uh, is the Green Paper, which outlines a total of 10 options for action by 2020. The illustration show the areas of action which with the individual op options. I will list them briefly. So uh, to the we, an, an, an important area is capacity reinforcement. So we define the um, option of developing synergies <clears throat> with science communication, expanding and establishing funding strengthening citizen science training and volunteer management, strengthening networking and exchange. Another area is the developing of new structures, cre it, creating a culture of valuing citizen science in society, science and policy, developing, developing structures and for ensuring data quality and data management, clarifying the legal and ethical framework conditions and <clears throat> integrating citizen science into scientific processes, integrating citizen science into education concepts for sustainable development and incorporating citizen science results into decision-making processes. These are all areas that also promote the principles of open science. Today, in 2020, we are currently evaluating this green paper from uh, 2016 and developing an, it into a white paper in a comparable strategy process. The goal is to adopt a consolidated citizen science strategy for 2030 for Germany. Next slide, please. On this slide, you can see the disciplines in which, which citizen science projects are carried out in Germany. As you can see, and as, as you might expect, citizen science plays the largest role in the environmental sciences and natural history, in, in natural history. So especially in life science, um, ecology, uh, zoology, and biology. Traditionally, citizen science is also widely used in archaeology and astronomy. We have seen a significant, in Germany, uh, we have seen a significant increase in the number of citizen science projects beyond traditional environmental research in recent years, especially in the disciplines of health research and humanities. Next slide, please. On this slide, I would like to give you some examples from citizen science project, projects from environmental research and observation, which have a very high visibility and are in high demand, first of all. And first of all, I would like to say that I have focused on examples that also provide information in English. In addition, there are, of course, a large number of regional projects. So 
Um, I give you some examples of uh, this flagship projects. Um, we observe is an Horizon Horizon 2020 projects, um, and uh, the main goal is to improve the coordination between existing exciting existing citizen observatories and related regional European and international activities. Landsense is uh, also an into Horizon 2020 project. So Horizon Horizon 2020 is um, um, the EU, or European Union um, research framework program. I uh, will come later to this. So Landsense is a citizen observatory and innovation marketplace for land use and land cover monitoring. It is coordinated by the Austrian International Institute of Applied Systems Analysis in Austria. I Naturalists Network, uh, we've heard already, um, as I remember correctly, is a global community of people who record observations of other organisms and share them with each other so all of us can learn more about the natural world. The German Barcode of Life Initiative um, sets up a reference library of DNA barcodes for the German fauna, flora, and fungi. It allows to the, the access to the DNA barcode reference library and is open for everyone. So it is a unique genetic library. The project Sensebox is a do-it-yourself kit box for stationary and mobile sensor stations, the so-called citizen science toolkit. And last but not least, finally, I would like to give you an example of for the use of apps to um, discover biodiversity. Naturblick app from the Natural History Museum um, in Berlin um, can easily identify animals and plants and, and you can um, uh, you can learn more about um, the nature of uh, uh, surrounding you. You can identify um, with the app um, singing birds um, uh, or uh, take pictures of plants and identify them with uh, the, the automatic image recognition. <clears throat> this app is um, um available free available um in the in in the uh app stores this apps uh, also play an important role in acquiring knowledge through play they are used especially by younger users next slide please The citizen science community has become very well organized in recent years. On this slide, you can see the most important networks and platforms in Europe and the German speaking world, uh, German speaking uh, countries. These platforms and networks are of course a great, a great, help, great help in supporting citizens in their search for interesting projects. The European Citizen Science Association <clears throat> was set up to encourage the growth of citizen science in Europe and to support the participation of the general public in research processes across science, social science, humanities, and the arts. EXA's mis mis mission is to connect citizens and science. Bürgerschaften Wissen, so citizens create knowledge, is the central platform for citizen science in Germany. The platform presents and connects and supports citizen science projects since uh, 2013. A comparable platform is the Austrian citizen, citizen science platform. The EU citizen science uh, project is an online platform for sharing knowledge, tools, training and resources for citizen science by the community for the commu and for the community. And last but not least, so universe, so so universe, it is mentioned already, uh, is according to own statement, the world's largest and most popular platform 
for people-powered research and gives people of all ages and backgrounds the change to participate in real research with over 50 active online citizen science projects. Next slide, please. Slide, please. Citizen science had a hard time with the funding organizations in the beginning. In the meantime, the situation has changed for the better and the funding landscape has evolved, at least in Germany and Europe. There's a growing number of funding programs and funding lines and a growing ac acceptance uh, for citizen science projects. The largest funding comes from the uh, already mentioned uh, German Federal Ministry of Education and Research. It is gratifying that citizens who have joined together to form NGOs or other initiatives, for example, or natural history societies can also get money. Uh, also, some foundations have launched uh, funding lines. We, the Leibniz Association, also support we are uh, special funding lines uh, in the area of transfer and dialogue citizen science projects. On the other side, unfortunately, the German Science Foundation, the so-called DFG, does not yet support any citizen science projects. In the European context, the EU, the already mentioned EU framework program for research and innovation, Horizon 2020, is the most important source of funding. For example, the science with and for society program. It will be instrumental in addressing the European social challenges tackled by Horizon 2020, building capacities and developing initiatives innovative ways of connecting science to society it will make science for attractive it may make science for attractive notably for to young people increase society's appetite for innovation and open up for further research innovation activities however our experience is that the funding instruments are often not adapted to the specific project design. So for example, um, the longer project duration and um, through public engagement and training and uh, coordination and that the funding budget are often still relatively small. So less, um, yes, less than um, 500,000 euros, for example. Uh, therefore, the Open Science Policy Platform, OSPP, uh, the European Open Science Policy, Policy Platform has therefore recommended the funding for citizen science projects should be flexible long term and allow for small and experimental projects in collaboration with key stakeholders to be funded. All these measures have resulted in a larger number of citizen science, citizen science projects currently in progress. Next slide, please. So my last slide is this already, I would like to summarize why I am firmly convinced that citizen science has a positive influence on the development of open science or that citizen science must be an integral part of open science. Um, citizen science participates in multiple stages to scientific processes uh, in co-design and co-publication. It generates uh, new knowledge. Um, in citizen science, citizen science increases scientific literacy and transparency. Citizen science can democratize the research processes. No innovation without participation. Citizen science contributes to awareness and acceptability raising. Citizen science benefits for professional scientists, uh, benefits for professional scientists and citizen scientists. So it is a, a like a win-win situation. And last but not least, um, allow, citizen science allows greater access to information and accessibility. Um, and promotes science communication. 
at the moment, of course, these are just, they are, uh, how can I say, just statements. Um, uh, social scientists are uh, investigating uh, to what extent the citizen science movement is changing science and um, the attitudes of citizen uh, scientists them themselves. It's like a big living laboratory and citizen science is changing repeatedly and but what impact citizen science has on science political decisions and public um, and uh, people is a central question of social science research. With these words, I come to the end and thank you for your attention. Please look me um, uh, in the following. I have listed the references with the download links. Um, you can uh, uh, next slide, please, or the next two slides, please. Um, one, yes, and and the last slide, please. And before I look forward to discussing uh, with you, I would like to draw your attention to an exciting international online conference, um, which is um, held just now in the um, in. Uh, about 10 days in, in as an online conference uh, in a, or a hybrid conference in Berlin. It is organized by the Leibniz uh, Research Museum, uh, the um, Museum for Natural History in Berlin. And uh, the, mm -hmm. the, folk, the topic is knowledge for uh, change, a decade for, of citizen science in support of the sustainable development goals. You are cordially invited to register for the streaming option until uh, the 9th October, um, if you like. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Matthias. That was absolutely wonderful. Mari kita beri tepuk tangan untuk Matthias. Wonderful. That was an incredible talk, and, and I really loved hearing about all the different initiatives. And it seems like for citizen science to operate at such a degree, there's so many different moving parts. There's so many different things that need to happen. There needs to be the infrastructure, there needs to be the communication platforms, there needs to be the funding. And so I'm very, very excited. I'm just going to give a brief summary of both of the talks in Indonesian before we progress the discussion session. Jadi pagi ini kita mendengar banyak sekali uh, ada dua talk yang sungguh luar biasa, satu dari Alison dan kedua dari Matthias, dan perspektif yang berbeda. Yang pertama, Al bicara tentang bagaimana City Science sudah ada di US dari zaman dulu, meskipun proyeknya enggak serumit atau gimana, tapi dari dulu sudah menginvolve orang awam dalam koleksi data, dalam citizen science dan benefitnya kelihatan sampai sekarang. Matthias juga bicara tentang apa yang dibutuhkan, dan tentang polisi, tentang infrastruktur, dan contohnya salah satunya tadi, adalah bahwa sedikit perubahan yang perlu dilakukan dan memang um, the system is never perfect, kita harus terus berkembang adalah funding dan uh, proyeknya perlu disesuaikan jadi banyak sekali yang kita bisa bicarakan terutama di Indonesia yang kita istilahnya penduduknya cukup besar gitu jadi potensi citizen science-nya juga cukup besar there's lots of wonderful things that we can discuss great, so I'm gonna start um, fielding some of the questions and would that be okay with the both of you? Great. Absolutely. So yeah, I've started. seen some great questions come in. Yeah. <coughs> no worries. And so we're not going to go in any particular order. It's going to be a little bit sporadic and we're going to have a bit of a discussion. Feel free to add on things if you'd like. And also to the rest of the team, kepada PDDI Lipi juga. If you have any suggestions or you want to chime in, feel free to do so. So one of the first questions that um, is actually a really great question by uh, Harry Bawono from the Indonesia National Archives, is what processes are in place, and I'm sure this will differ from one field to another, to make sure that the data is valid um, for one project to another, or sorry, within the data collection process. And this goes to the both of you. Sure. Um, Dr. Premke Kraus, do you want to start or should I? Uh, you can uh, start, please. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, um, I'm I'm sure that you'll have a more uh, 
detailed expert take on it. But um, in general, uh, the you know ensuring that the the data that is received from citizen and volunteer science is is valid that is absolutely a, a, a important concern um and it relates to uh how any type of scientific endeavor is carried out right so important is is clear training uh for anybody that's taking part um training in terms of uh of you know either how to you know something so specific as, as working equipment or reading the equipment and reading the data that comes off of the equipment, um, what not to do, how not to accidentally uh, sully the data that you receive, um, the timeliness of collecting and reporting data, um, all of these elements of good training, clear training from the start can help to ensure that the data that comes out uh, is, um, is indeed uh, strong and reliable data. Um, and that kind of training also uh, pertains to the work that professional scientists and researchers do. Um, so that's the first thing that comes to mind. And that's something that I know a lot of programs in the US uh, will emphasize, right? That um, whatever federal agency is putting together a citizen science project, um, that agency has thought through and developed a very good training program before the science uh, before the citizens take part so i'll start with that um dr premke kraus what else would you uh would you add yes um i agree um this is um what i uh, said in the um in my um talk um that's the project design is uh, um, an other specific um, design you have you need a lot of time if you start a, a citizen science science project to uh, for the um, training for communicating with um, citizens um, usually in, in Germany or in um, a project during the project duration is about two or three years but the citizen science project have a, a, a duration um, of um, five years um, approximately so you need really a lot of time to for um, as um, Alison mentioned for training and uh, for um, uh, communicating with uh, citizens and um, but we have a very very good experience um, uh, and um, we uh, citizens ha have um, have um, uh, a lot of um, respons responsibilities and um, sometimes the leadership in citizen science project it is also important to know it is not only the um, yes the professional scientists um, but uh, the, it can could be also a citizen um, like an, um, an ngo in germany you have the so called naturschutzbund or <laughs> and uh, they have they ha um, the naturschutzbund have a great project uh, um, um, which are led by this uh, group of uh, citizens so um it, you have really um, um, in, in, and it, it's important um, that scientists uh, work together with science uh, communicator. And uh, this is also a second important point um, because um, you, you, you need to, um, to you, had, you need to engage the, special groups of so for example yeah, um, younger people or um, and, and it is really um, 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 yes um, an important issue that uh, scientists work together with science communicators uh, and with uh, um, to connect uh, citizens with scientists. Thank you very much. These are excellent answers. Um, apakah ada yang dari PDDI LIPI uh, yang mau menambahkan? Is there anyone from the LIPI team that like to add anything on? Great, no worries. So I'm just going to quickly summarize in Indonesian. Jadi katakan oleh Alison. I'll start Alison. Did you want to add something on? Oh, no, no. Tidak, tidak. 
Till jag kan. <laughs> no just worries. unmuting. No worries. And so it seems to me that the key to it is just really thorough preparation, isn't it? Um, just to make sure that there's enough time, there's enough funding, there's enough training um, to be able to make sure that the people participating in Citizen Side will ultimately yield valid data. Jadi semuanya dat kembali kepada persiapan. Training yang cukup, waktu yang cukup, um, agar data yang didapat itu berkualitas dan bisa dipakai. Contohnya, Dr. Prem Krauss katakan bahwa proyek biasa itu hanya 2-3 tahun, tetapi yang pakai Citizen Science itu bisa sampai 5 tahun untuk persiapannya, untuk trainingnya, agar datanya bisa ditapak. Tapi yang kita lihat tadi, meskipun jangka waktunya lebih lama dan fundingnya lebih lama, ada banyak sekali kelebihan dari citizen science. There are so many benefits to citizen science that the, the time spent and the, the funding and the training really is worth it for the projects. Great. Moving on to another question. I've gotten a few questions, um, similar questions from many different places, including the YouTube channel. And this is a very big one, a very, very exciting, very big question. So how do we actually get started? How do we get people engaged in citizen science? And just a little bit of a disclaimer, um, in Indonesia, our policy making has been rather divorced with science and science hasn't been one of the strongest um, keys in, in any sort of key decision making. Um, and so how do we shift from that or our current state or how you perceive our state to be in a very candid, honest manner? So how do we shift it into citizen science? Um, people have been talking about incentives, about government policies. How do we get there, according to you? And I apologize, I apologize in advance. I realize it's a very large and broad question. And so I'm happy for this to be more of a discussion. Um, Alison, would you like to go first or Dr. Prem Bekros? I mean, I can offer an initial thought that, um, you know, there's wherever possible, there's a saying in English, uh, we don't need to reinvent the wheel, right? So there are there are many, many resources out there, um, certainly in the English language uh, inter internet, and I'm sure as well across Europe and other languages, uh, Dr. Premka Kraus, um, about how, um, for example, uh, um, research institutions, universities, non-governmental organizations and schools, how um, at that level, those actors can start to uh, think about and design small scale citizen science projects um, and then gain experience and success at their scale that can then be taken to various government agencies, not necessarily starting at the national level, right, or the federal level, but maybe your local government and um, using the resources and the knowledge from, from other citizen science initiatives that have been successful, you can then take your results, take your positive experiences and impact, and then go to your local government bodies um, and lobby for more, uh, for more awareness, for more, um, and potentially for more resources, and then take the conversation from there. But there is certainly a wealth now of of really valuable, positive, and successful stories, as well as stories where citizen science projects didn't work, right? So I would start there in some of those catalogs of online toolkits, for example, on citizenscience.gov, um, but certainly not only there, um, many other so sources, um, kind of yeah, repositories of information like that are available worldwide. Yes, I, I agree. Um, I will give you an example of, um, um, from the, our Leibniz Association um, to this uh, Leibniz Association. Um, it's an umbrella organization with um, uh, nearly 100 institutes in Germany. And each of these institutes uh, dealing with uh, uh, different dis uh, di disciplines have uh, not each, but um, a lot of these institutes have uh, s um, small offices for knowledge exchange. So um, there are really um, th there are people, science communicators, which um, work together with scientists at the institutes, but also with um, 
people from um, from with people volunteer peoples or with policy makers so they, they are they translate um, they are they are responsible for the translation of um, science uh, scientific um, language uh, to to public and we have a very good experience with uh, um, such small offices because it is really um, um, a lot of work and 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 you need really a lot of time in, we have um, several years we have um, in germany we have several years uh, connected people uh, but also connected scientists with citizens but and um, um, you need uh, really time and different um, f uh, participatory formats and instruments uh, like multi-stakeholder dialogues or um, it's a, or um, at, at the national level but also at the at a local or regional level absolutely thank you so much for the answers so i'll just quickly summarize in that jadi kedua narasumber katakan bahwa um, sebenarnya ada banyak case study dan banyak cara-cara yang udah available di internet Uh, contoh dari citizen, citizenscience.gov itu bagaimana kita bisa memulai di skala yang kecil. Jadi banyak proyek tadi dikatakan itu skalanya cukup besar, itu sudah skala nasional. Tapi banyak sekali proyek yang mulai dari institusi masing-masing. Dan itu um, jika kita mau mulai citizen science bisa mulainya dari sana. Um, that's wonderful. I, I wanted to uh, continue on this vein. In the projects that you've encountered, and this is more of, of just your personal experience, Um, do typically are t people typically um, given some sort of incentive, financial incentive, or somehow? Or what do you see are the driving factors of people wanting to participate in projects of citizen science? Um, yeah. Maybe Dr. Pramka Kraus, okay, would you like sure. to start with this one? Um, perhaps you have more direct uh, current experience and such. And then I can speak more broadly uh, to what to what I've yeah heard. Um, yes, um, this is. I I I, I from my experience uh, the people um, would to. Um, um engage uh, people would uh, participate in science um science related um experimental um projects uh, because um they have um they see the um the great the grand challenges like climate change or biodiversity loss so there are a lot of um Um, um, a lot of um, dynamic um, changes, and um, they have um, they have a lot of um, they they see that only um, science based um, results can improve the situation. Um, like uh, uh, the climate uh, change or biodiversity loss, so uh, they um, it is um, they have a uh, how I should call it. they have um, Would it be a sort of internal motivation, seeing the current situation, and they're just internally motivated to help out um, on the sort of projects? Yeah. Um, Alison, maybe you can 
Sure. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think uh, I think Dr. Pramka Kraus, you're you're addressing it from a from a um, yeah very much like a um, kind of an existential <laughs> perspective um, and um, the kind of perspective that I think of, for example, um, why I would love to be involved in volunteer and citizen science projects, because I am so passionate about addressing climate change, improving air quality, um, making sure that we do what we can to, uh, to keep biodiversity. Um, there are also a number of more, I don't know the best way to describe it, kind of practical um, incentives in terms of what participants get out of being uh, volunteer scientists, along with that satisfaction of contributing and making a difference. Um, various programs across uh, the US federal government, for example, uh, offer uh, grants or other type of financial support, um, as we saw in the uh, zoo hackathon example with the second place Indonesian team. Um, and this financial support, these financial awards are made possible thanks to the legislation that allocated um, or that said such programs shall include incentives in these forms for, uh, for uh, successful participants or grantees. Um, in some cases, there can also be credits at the university level that can be that can be offered, or some type of coursework for uh, for uh, for students um, if they participate in certain citizen science projects. Um, in certain cases, and this is I am not the expert, but this is my understanding um, from what I've heard. Uh, volunteers can also be included in scientific papers or uh, research presentations for their uh, for their contributions if they reach a certain level of uh, of integrity as well as you know the impact of their of their um, uh, participation so those are just a few examples from that other angle but I think the angle that that you're talking about dr. Premka Kraus is a much deeper more fundamental, aspect of kind of personally driven incentives for being involved that I think is also um, is also crucial to understand and to appreciate. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So I'm just going to quickly summarize in Indonesian. Jadi saat kita mau engage um, populasi Indonesia dalam citizen science, itu ada dua perspektif. Yang pertama yang dijawabkan oleh Dr. Premka Kraus adalah pertanyaan-pertanyaan itu memang harus yang penting bagi mereka. Harusnya mereka merasa ini suatu hal yang penting, ini suatu hal yang saya bisa membantu, satu hal yang saya bisa kontribusi. Jadi saat mereka ada internal motivation tersebut, mereka sendiri terdorong untuk bisa membantu. Saya ingat sekali, there's a personal anecdote. I remember that sense of wonder I would have as a primary school student. There's much of it still left, but just exploring the world and seeing the good I can do. And I think citizen science um, could could really use some of that wonder, some of that curiosity as people are just wide-eyed and thinking I can help the world and contribute in science in some way. Jadi contohnya di anak-anak SMP, SMA, ataupun kuliahan, um, tentu dengan caranya yang spesifik dan dengan cukup beretika, mereka ada banyak sekali perasaan, saya bisa membantu dunia dengan science. Dan salah satu caranya kita bisa, itu sediakan wadah citizen science. Um, secara praktisnya, Alison juga katakan bahwa ada beberapa program yang ada insentif, contohnya dengan university credit, dengan ada award yang tadi dikatakan, dan memang um, saya rasa di setiap proyek itu berbeda, tergantung uh, populasinya, tergantung proyeknya, tergantung institusinya, and so it's really important to, for us to match the incentives, whether it's internal or external, with the project itself. That's great, and actually, um, on that note, I'd love to invite Mas Chayo from one of the organizers of this incredible event to talk about some citizen science projects that are actually happening in Indonesia um, that are that's in collaboration with the Good Institute. Can the um, operators please put Mas Chayo in the, yeah, uh, Mas in the window with us? Siap, saya sudah bergabung. Sip, um, jadi Siap. Mas Chayo akan Suara sudah bahasa Indonesia. Ya? Sip, jelas sekali. Nanti Mas Chayo akan bicara bahasa Indonesia, lalu and then I'll translate everything in English after for everyone watching. Oke. Okay. Sekarang ya Mas Sony ya. Belum kelihatan. Sudah kelihatan. Ah, sudah sudah sudah. Silakan. Oke okay, oke. Okay. Ya. Yeah. 
Terima kasih Mas Oni kesempatannya. Uh, hi Matias, Alison, how are you? Hope you are well. Hi, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Oke, okay, uh, jadi uh, untuk para peserta webinar, kita sebenarnya dari bulan sekitar bulan uh, Juli kita bekerja sama dengan Gute Institute. mengadakan salah satu kegiatan citizen science yang merupakan rangkaian dari apa namanya proyek retas budaya. Jadi nih saya share dulu screen saya sudah kelihatan ya. Jadi Guten Institute punya satu program namanya retas budaya. Yakni kalau di luar itu dikenal dengan program data hack Ethan. Jadi Guten Institute ingin membuat adaptasinya versi Indonesia kita namakan retas budaya. Jadi Kita bikin salah satu tracknya ini uh, Citizen Science and Open Data. Jadi kalau kita klik uh, di sini kita uh, mengundang untuk seluruh warga negara Indonesia kita nggak peduli uh, apa dia profesinya, apa dia uh, status uh, apa namanya pendidikannya, selama dia ingin berkontribusi terhadap pelestarian budaya dan mendokumentasikan uh, data budaya tersebut dalam bentuk digital itu. bisa terlibat dalam kegiatan ini. Tadi saya sudah share uh, apa namanya link untuk register untuk berpartisipasi dalam kegiatan ini. Jadi sederhananya untuk uh, Bapak Ibu peserta kegiatan webinar, uh, Bapak Ibu bisa berkontribusi dalam proyek uh, Citizen Science uh, Retas Budaya ini dengan cara mendokumentasikan data budaya. Jadi kalau misalnya di dekat rumah Ibu ada atau Bapak ada uh, semacam bangunan heritage gitu, cukup difoto, kita kasih metadata yang lengkap. Kemudian kalau ada filosofinya tinggal ditambahkan, kemudian diupload di sistem uh, repository data yang kebetulan kita di LIPI sudah menyediakan platformnya yang namanya Repository Ilmiah Nasional. Jadi nanti kalau Bapak Ibu sudah register di sistem apa uh, registrasi tadi, kita akan berikan panduan teknisnya untuk bagaimana bisa uh, terlibat dalam kegiatan ini. Kemudian nanti pada bulan November tanggal uh, 6 sampai dengan 8 November itu a- adalah acara puncaknya. Uh, hostnya adalah Guta Institute Indonesia di Jakarta. Uh, nanti Bapak Ibu untuk tiga karya terbaik akan mempresentasikan hasil dari pendokumentasian budaya tersebut. Jadi yang kita nilai kriterianya antara lain metadata, kemudian uh, kelengkapan dokumentasinya, yakni kalau ada filosofinya, kemudian kualitas image atau soundnya, itu nanti yang akan uh, mendapatkan uh, semacam penghargaan lah dari ya, LIPI dan juga Guta Institute. Jadi ini sekalian saya promosi event retas budaya. Jadi ada tanggal 6 sampai tanggal 8 nanti kegiatannya virtual juga. Informasinya akan kita share juga nanti via kanal-kanal sosial media LIPI ataupun kanal sosial medianya PDDI LIPI. Seperti itu. Jadi nanti kalau memang ingin terlibat silakan isi di chat tadi register bit.ly apa citizen science. Jadi kita sih nggak apa namanya ini kalau saya lihat um, cukup antusias pesertanya ya dari yang sudah register sudah beberapa upload foto jadi ada juga yang uh, dia upload musik musik sekarang musik alternatif ya tapi kita nggak tahu 20-30 tahun ke depan mungkin akan jadi salah satu uh, budaya juga ya bahwa di Indonesia dulu pernah ada musik seperti ini gitu jadi memang memang uh, panggilan kepada seluruh anak bangsa ya yang memang peduli terhadap uh, kekayaan budaya kita harapannya bisa uh, data tersebut bisa dinikmati oleh generasi selanjutnya untuk kepentingan pendidikan dan juga pengembangan ilmu pengetahuan. Itu yang jadi goals utama kita. Mungkin itu sih Mas Oni sedikit cerita. Iya, terima kasih banyak Mas Cayo. So for everybody watching in YouTube as well, um, PDD, PDD LIPI as well as the Good Institute has this incredible initiative, Citizen Science Initiative, on the topic of culture. And especially um, people in Indonesia realize just how incredibly diverse our culture is. For example, my... Um, my family, part of my family comes from the Minangkabau culture, which is in Sumatra. And so the project is to essentially document and to be able to store and and to document all the different cultures in Indonesia, what's happening when it comes to music, when it comes to different facets of who we are, especially since Indonesia has an incredible number of dialects and the cultures and the cuisines and the music are reflected in that. And so I think And according to what Dr. Premkakas was talking about, this is something that's very dear and very close to the Indonesian's heart, the preservation of culture. Um, and that's evident in everything that we do. We're in formal events. We still very much are proud to use the batik that we have um, into, into the formal events and everything. And so it's a, 
Just a few more details. The registration is from the 15th of August to the 25th of October. Um, there's an online webinar kickoff on the 18th. Oh, sorry, the, the, the webinar was on the 18th of August. But then um, there's a presentation for the 7th to the 8th of October. And in line um, practically on what uh, Allison was saying before, there is an incentive, there is a reward for people deemed to be doing um, meritorious work on the 8th of November. So this is an example of what's happening in Indonesia. So for everybody watching from different universities, I think this is a great model. Come to the event. Um, a very respected leader in Indonesia's open science, uh, Dr. Nasabta Erwin, is going to be moderating there as well. Um, and so have a look, see what it looks like in practice in our country. That's great. Um, so moving on, there's a question here and citizen science is an incredible idea where we but it requires a lot of infrastructure and i've received a question which is very very technical um, and if you have the answer that's great if not that's okay as well but what sort of data storage are we looking at and what sort of um, communications infrastructure because we're having lots of data pouring in um, from all different parts of the country especially if this was to be rolled out in indonesia um, with this huge population, we would need a lot of infrastructure to make sure the data came in securely. Can you speak a little bit to sort of the data um, storage? And if you have knowledge about it, um, what sort of protocol, data protection protocols may be in place there? Yes, I'm, I'm um, sorry, I'm uh, not a tech, I have this technical, um, um, knowledge about the data storage. Uh, I, I'm a biologist and, um, and so I couldn't answer to this question. I'm sorry. It's a great no one. Possible. Yeah, it's a great question. I saw that as well. Thank you for asking. Uh, <laughs> I am also not a data science special uh, specialist. Um, luckily, my husband, who's also sitting here today, he has much more uh, he has much more experience in general um, uh, in terms of uh, in the IT field overall, and also understanding how open data works. Uh, he helped me crunch a few initial numbers um, uh, that, for example. Um, uh, well, in the United States, data.gov is our centralized uh, overall repository for open data across the government. Um, thank you very much to my husband <laughs> who did a quick search. Um, there are over 200,000 data sets available today, right now, on data.gov. Um, over 25% each of those uh, uh, apply to the area of earth sciences and the oceans. So again, I think that is a reflection of, uh, of the level of activity and how long our um, US Geological Survey and our National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration have been active and engaged in forms of volunteer scientists. Um, <laughs> yes, I saw somebody just just comment. It is very fortunate that I married <laughs> to somebody who knows data science and that both my parents are geologists. Yes. Um, um, so data.gov is a great place to go, but the, the amount of information there is massive. Um, also doing a really quick search, our National Institutes of Health which is also very active in terms of different uh, data collection and uploading initiatives related to, of course, uh, to, to public health at, in all stages of life, right? Um, uh, they have approximately 30 petabytes of open data that has been collected and is being used. Um, but that's just one snapshot of one Institute in the federal government. Um, overall, the US federal government has recently developed and published both a federal data strategy and a federal cloud strategy um, to for the federal government institutions uh, to use going forward to address concerns such as data privacy, data security, uh, cybersecurity writ large, um, and availability to data whose integrity is preserved, right? So these are certainly questions now that lawmakers are addressing. Um, it's, a, it's definitely an evolving space um, 
but um, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, that that's how our, our federal government is moving forward now. Um, but that was a great question. I'm definitely curious. So I'm going to go back now and, and take a look at the different agencies and see if, if they have rough estimates of how much data each of them have available. Thank you so much for the answers. And just a note, the one who, who posted that one line, um, Dr. Dasata Erwin is a good friend of ours. And one of the reasons he noted is that because he's also a geologist. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. Rock power. Yes. It's great. Absolutely. That's great. So I have a, a question on, on from my side. So this is a personal question for me. It seems like a lot of the examples, and rightfully so, pertain to more of the natural sciences. Um, sorry, what I mean natural sciences, um, it's um, a lot to do with, with the forest and the ocean. And it seems like a lot of citizen science goes around there. So my specific field um, has a little bit more constraints. It's a little bit more sensitive because I'm in mental health and suicide prevention. And obviously we know that there are a bit more um, ethical considerations when it, when it comes to that. Do you know of any examples or any initiatives where citizen science is rolled out in say more behavioral sciences or specifically mental health and suicide prevention? Or just any thoughts surrounding that that you may have? That's a that's a really great question. I, I can start by saying um, that I'm aware of uh, certainly um, various uh, citizen or volunteer science programs connected to to other aspects of physical health. For example, uh, patients with asthma. Um, I, I heard the other day patients with asthma turning on um, turning GPS functions on their phone, and then whenever they have to use their inhaler out and about. Um, their phone records both the time of the inhaler being used as well as where you are. Um, so that information helps not only the patient personally, but also helps doctors understand uh, environmental factors connected to that. Um, also, of course, in, in, you know, in, in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, there is all sorts of information uh, that individual, uh, individual members of the public can be sharing, either those who have had you know, zero symptoms and then pet tested positive or negative. Um, of course, there are real potential data privacy concerns that need to be taken into account. Um, and I, I don't personally, again, I'm not an expert. I don't personally know of, of any, uh, of any examples um, in my, in my research and preparing for this today in the mental health and suicide prevention field. But I can imagine that that it would be possible and that they would be very impactful. And I'll go back and do some research, Masone, uh, into what the National Institutes of Health have. They may well have some programs. I'm just not aware of it right now. But maybe Dr. Premke Kraus knows, knows more from the German perspective. Um, I know from uh, that there are some projects uh, from the uh, some public health uh, citizen science project, um, but I um, do not know exactly what um, what uh, the background is. And um, I, I said that in the last um, yes two or three years, um, the uh, our ministry um, has um, um, funded um, more and more. Um, projects uh, um, besides natural sciences. So um, um, all other disciplines, um, uh, especially the um, health um, sciences, look look at the citizen science project from natural sciences and learn from it. So there are more and more people um, 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 fr scientists from um, uh, for example, um, from um, in the in a clinical context or epidemiologists um, uh, who uh, who transfer the uh, methods and the tools, citizen science tools, to um, to questions um, 
of um, of public health. But I, I, unfortunately, I um, do not know a special uh, project uh, dealing with mental health. Sorry, from Germany, not. That's no problems at all. Thank you so much for the answers, Daddy. Uh, just to summarize in Indonesian, selain science yang berkaitan dengan um, dengan apa natural sciences yang contohnya ad, tentang the ocean atau the forest itu memang sudah ada proyek di luar itu contohnya yang tadi Alsen katakan orang bisa dokumentasi saat mereka mengalami asma kapan pakai inhalernya lokasinya di mana dan memang sudah ada proyek yang di luar space itu um, yang sudah menginvolve citizen science and so thank you for that now we're actually going to open up um, the questions for people to ask directly uh, using voice chat, if that's okay with uh, the both of you. Sure thing. So, wonderful. Jadi, bagi yang mau bertanya, silakan raise hand. Dan saya akan dikasih tahu sama timnya. Tapi pertama-tama saya ingin mengundang salah satu pertanyaan uh, dari Ludia Arika. Apakah ada di sini? Ludia Arika, ada, apakah ada di sini? Salah satu pertanyaan tentang kebijakan dan strategi citizen science. Ya mas, sudah kita panggil. Sip, kita tunggu sebentar ya. We're just gonna wait a little bit. Sudah ada mas? Ya sudah. Oke. Okay. Halo, uh, Ludi, Ludia ada di sana? Oke, okay. begitu nggak apa-apa. Mungkin saat ini. Oke, okay, apakah suara saya bisa terdengar? Iya, terdengar, Mbak. Silakan okay. pertanyaannya. Terima kasih. Selamat pagi kepada Mas Onim, Mbak Ala, dan Mas Matias ya. Semoga sehat selalu. Uh, sangat menarik materi-materi yang dipaparkan hari ini. Memang ada pertanyaan yang kurang lebih uh, kita pernah hadapi mungkin ya. Bagaimana sih kendala-kendala atau aturan dan regulasi yang bisa uh, menampung ataupun memberikan solusi terhadap kegiatan citizen science ini seperti itu kurang lebihnya. Terima kasih Mas Oni. Iya, sama-sama Mbak. Um, so the question was by Mbak Ludia is that she says thank you so much for coming. She really really enjoys the material and she hopes that you're both in good health. And so she wants to ask about the key regulations um, and as well as challenges and strategies that are in place that need to that are put in place to make sure um sorry just give me one second i'm trying to rephrase the question a little bit jadi mbak ludia kalau misalnya saya ada salah ngomong silahkan tulis di chat aja ya tapi i think what she's interested in is what sort of challenges strategies and uh, rules are put in place for the people participating as well as the institutions to make sure that this can go smoothly do institutions that want to participate so um Dr. Prem Prakash, you mentioned it was an umbrella sort of institution, and then universities and different groups joined in. Are there certain requirements that need to be put in place for maybe groups or organizations to join in on such efforts? Do they, what, do, what is the requirement for them and what rules and regulations and strategies are put in place for that? Um. <clears throat> It is um, there are it is open for, for all um, citizens first of all and um, but um, there are um, the, the they have there is there are no um, specific um, rules or requirements to to get a citizen scientists um, um, they they have to bring a motivation and um, and then uh, it is um, it is um, 
So the, our scientists from our institutes are open to all um, interested uh, people who will participate in citizen science. Um, of course, um, um, they are they must be tra trained, uh, as we have mentioned already, and um, they um, it is important that they. Um, Yes, it's that uh, they communicate with um, our scientists. But um, from from my um, experience, um, the, the the scientists from our institutes um, ha have no such rules. I don't. I, maybe you can add something, Alison. Sure. Um, I think, yeah, it's um, it's important to balance uh, interest and in being open to whomever would like to participate uh, with, you know, ultimately quality control and um, uh, and um, validity or integrity of results. Um, but I think absolutely one key point is having uh, is getting the word out about. Um, about the importance of citizen science projects of all different kinds, right? Across the across the spectrum of scientific activity, across the spectrum of what kinds of uh, engagement are are requested or needed. Um, yeah, so communication. I mean, that's something that we've we've both already talked about. Um, Dr. Pramka Kraus also uh, emphasized the importance of preparation. So if you don't have the time or the ability to really prepare in advance um, uh, a citizen science endeavor to the best of your ability, then of course that can also become a, a, a kind of a stumbling block, right? A hambatan or a kandala. Um, infrastructure is also, as we've already talked about, right? Really key. And I think infrastructure is also a place where um, policy fits into requirements, right? And policy is so important. Um, I understand that um, in Indonesia and in the United States, there's a lot of discussion about uh, filling in uh, digital gaps um, in especially rural areas or in areas where economic development is not uh, as, uh, as high or as or as complete as in other areas. Um, I mean, this also happens in my home state of West Virginia in the United States. Um, it is a state with a very small population compared to other uh, states on the East Coast, um, quite rural as well. Fid yes, filling in the digital gap, absolutely. Um, and this takes not only motivation and communication, but it very much requires a government commitment to uh, to funding, a government commitment to actually creating the infrastructure and maintaining it, right? And a government commitment to the, uh, to the safety and integrity of that infrastructure, right? Um, so I think those are also just a few additions to uh, what Dr. Pramke Kraus uh, said. Um, uh, that hopefully start to address that question, but that, that's a great wide um, or, or uh, wide ranging question as well. Absolutely, thank you so much for that. So what I gather um, is that there needs to be proper policy and infrastructure in place, and that's mostly a top down thing, whether it's from the government um, or whether it's from the leading institution, the powers that may be, they're the ones that need to in make sure, okay, that this is possible. But also, we need to adopt a mindset that Dr. Primka Kraus just elaborated beautifully that it's open to everyone. If you want to participate in science and you have, you have the means to do so, please do so. So I'm just going to quickly translate into Indonesian. Jadi saat kita melakukan citizen science, sekali lagi ditekankan sangat penting kita memiliki infrastruktur dan persiapan yang baik. Dan itu adalah tugas yang memimpin, apakah itu pemerintahan atau institusi, untuk ensure orang-orang yang ikut, mereka memiliki... Um, the means atau infrastruktur dan training yang baik. Dan yang ditekankan oleh Dr. Prem Kekras adalah kita jangan coba halang-halangin orang. 
Karena sains harusnya terbuka untuk semuanya. Jika mereka mau ikut, mereka mau partisipasi, maka mereka boleh. And I think that's absolutely wonderful. I'm, I, I, I'm quite curious on that same question. Have you ever encountered the citizen science project proposal? Um, because I think in Indonesia, as we're exploring new things, we need to know where the boundaries are. We need to understand that um, what would be a good idea, what wouldn't be a good idea. Have you encountered a citizen science project or an implementation of it where you looked at that and said, mm, this may not be the best way to go about doing it? So examples of perhaps not the best way to implement um, citizen science projects. Uh, doctor, would you like to go first? Yes, um, sure. <laughs> um, um, we, I, as I mentioned, we have um, a an, um, project competition within the Leibniz Association, and we uh, we get a lot of um, proposals for citizen science project, and um, um, we have a special special specific criteria, and. Um, there are sometimes um, there are proposals um, which um, um, don't fill this criteria. And uh, what criteria are, for example, um, the the how. Um, uh, how is the the way to implement for example projects um so sometimes the questions um are too uh, academic and too complex and too theoretical so if we have uh, um, proposals from molecular by bi biology science for example um there are strong um limitations i would say if um, it comes in a proposal from um, uh, from infection biology institute from us for example then um, it uh, it could be that the the methods and uh, experiments ep experiments are um, um, not not um, practicable for citizens so this is maybe an example where are uh, uh, yeah limitations and uh, to to fund uh, uh, or to yeah, to fund some proposals so um you said um that citizen science comes uh, come comes from the natural sciences and, and environmental sciences and it has a reason because um, people uh, go outside and um, in love nature and um, and it is um, relatively easy to um, to learn by 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 apps for example or by uh, in earlier time by uh, books uh, uh, about plant and uh, fauna um, um, systematic but um, and um, this is really an, an experience which uh, we we can use for high density um, uh, data of biodiversity changes, uh, biodiversity losses. So it's, but there are other scientific fields uh, where it is, which, where it is difficult to apply the citizen science approach. Great. Um, Alison, would you like to add on anything to that? No, I think, um... Dr. Pumka Kraus really uh, gave some yeah, great input on that. Um, I haven't had nearly as much ex uh, exposure to, to proposals um, as, as he has, but um, in terms of uh, hackathon projects, for example, that I've seen in the State Department, um, again, some of the ideas, the ideas are fantastic, but in terms of actual implementation based on resources available to volunteers, it just, it 
it doesn't quite get there, right? Um, or the communication um, by the by the team um, as to how they're going to make that work at a volunteer level. It just doesn't quite quite get there. But um, but the but the enthusiasm always comes through. So <laughs> there are other ways maybe that the project can be massaged or edited um, and become something viable in the future. No worries at all. That's absolutely wonderful. Let me um, just summarize that real quick in Indonesian. Jadi memang saat kita melakukan citizen science, salah satu hal yang paling penting adalah pertanyaannya apa. Jangan pertanyaan yang terlalu teoritis ataupun pertanyaan yang kurang relevan bagi orang yang ikut. Karena salah satu yang hal yang penting dalam citizen science adalah citizen yang memang koleksi data tersebut mereka pun bisa melakukannya dan mereka tertarik makanya banyak sekali itu di environmental sciences soalnya mereka bisa keluar mereka bisa melihat um, alam dan mereka bisa collect datanya dengan cukup baik kok tadi contohnya uh, salah satu pertanyaan tentang uh, apa tadi molecular uh, biology itu mungkin agak sulit bagi orang-orang awam untuk memahaminya ataupun apresiasi kenapa perlu koleksi data tersebut Um, jadi itu jawabannya. Great. Um, and so I'm very, very excited because Kurt de Belder is now here with us and he's ready on the panel. And so I think that given um, that Kurt is here, we might actually jump into his presentation. I've confirmed that um, he's okay with it. And then we can continue the discussion after that. Um, for Allison and Dr. Premkakas, is that okay with the both of you? Yes, sure. Sure thing. Wonderful. Um, jadi operator silakan, Kurt kita persilakan masuk ke dalam panelisnya. So, Kurt adalah um, librarian ke-25 di Leiden University. Dia selalu memegang pos um, posisi tersebut sejak tahun 2005. Dan dia adalah founding director dari Leiden University Press. Sebelumnya dia pernah memegang posisi um, di Universitas Van Amsterdam, New York University, University of California di Berkeley, dan Stanford University. Saat ini dia sedang di Board of Directors of the Council of Library and Information Resources di USA dan di Steering Community of the Information and Open Access Policy Group of the League of European Research Universities dan juga Board of Directors di Open Access Publishing in European Networks. Jadi kita sangat-sangat senang bisa mengundang Kurt di sini. Kurt, are you with us today? I am. Thank you very much, uh, Sandy. Uh, yeah. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for the very kind invitation. I also hope that everyone who is uh, participating in this uh, seminar is uh, doing well and and that they and their loved ones are are safe and healthy. Thank you very much. Um, where are you based at the moment? You're based in. I'm 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 right now at home uh, because it's very early in the morning. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, yeah ten ten uh, ten to seven a.m. Uh, yeah, it's still it's still dark outside, uh, and uh, yeah, so I'm in Leiden, in the Netherlands. Uh, yeah. Oh, wonderful! And I think that Dr. Prem Grekas was saying something similar. I think that for us and for all of us in Indonesia, we thank you so much to the two of you for negotiating this rather odd time <laughs> to be able to share yeah, the information to us. I've never given a, 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 a talk this early in the morning, so uh, but it's it's fine. No worries at all. Great, so let's get the slides ready. Uh, operator bisa persilakan slide-nya uh, Kurt dipersiapkan. And I think that's it. Uh, the floor is yours, Kurt. All right. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, I've been asked to talk about European Open Science Policy and especially how it impacts an academic library. And I've obviously, uh, uh, I've, I've taken my own library as, a, as an example, but I think it's, it's just an example. I think a lot of libraries are doing a lot of the sim of similar things, uh, but uh, of course uh, that is the example I, I know the best. I'll, I'll do make some uh, some inroads into what possibly other libraries are doing uh, differently, uh, but I'll, I'll focus mostly on what's happening in Leiden with regard to the European Open Science Policy. So next slide, please. Um, uh, I've put in uh, yeah a definition of open science since this is an open science conference. I'm not going to dwell on this. Obviously, uh, we all know what open science is. Um, and uh, you, you do see sometimes a little bit of different different emphases. Uh, yeah. uh, again, since we were just uh, listening to a conversation about public science, um, I think in the Dutch uh, uh, definition, it's also something that is very 
uh, very strongly emphasized. And so the opportunity to co cooperate and contribute to and make use of the scientific process. So uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, LERU, which is the League of U European Research Universities, has published in 2018 a report on open science and in universities. And um, where they really say, well, you need to, um, it's not a, a quick fix, fix, it's a really a deep cultural change that needs to happen in order to make the, the, the change from the way science has been practiced in the, in the uh, how it is practiced basically at this point to um, moving towards this open, this open vision. And, uh, and it requires a number of things, leadership, vision, uh, obviously, uh, 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 one has to share a, a vision, that vision that uh, uh, as a researcher and as support staff in order to be able to do that. But, uh, and we can go to the next slide, a cultural change is of course uh, very different, uh, very difficult. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, and uh, yeah, Jeffrey Bolton uh, has famously said, well, changing a university is like moving a graveyard, you get no help from the people inside. Uh, yeah. And uh, in a way that's true, we all, I think we all, uh, all of us who work at universities uh, uh, notice that in fact, universities are inherently conservative uh, organizations. Uh, we work with how things work, uh, that is how it, uh, that's how it's done. And making uh, substantial changes there, and especially cultural changes, is 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 far from easy. Nevertheless, I think it's really uh, happening. Uh, yeah, I do think uh, universities are making uh, that uh, that step towards a uh, profound cultural change, and there has been a very interesting uh, process going on, where universities, libraries, politics at the national international level level have had an interplay. Um, uh, of taking, of lobbying, taking measures, responding to measures. And let's go to the next slide for that. Uh, yeah, um, here you can see a number of the initiatives that have taken, and I, uh, it's not that I'm going to discuss all of these, but I really wanted to show the, uh, sometimes the, the many years it takes, when you look at the Budapest uh, Open Access Initiative, when you look at the Berlin Declaration, these were done in 2002, 2003. Um, and yeah, then for a while, it seems as if nothing happens. Of course, a lot happened in that time. Uh, uh, most of our, the libraries put up uh, repositories. Uh, yeah. uh, so a lot of work was done, a lot of discussion took place, a lot of uh, yeah, um, uh, lobbying also took place. And then you start seeing things move. And uh, you see that with a number of declarations again. But for example, in 2013, uh, in the Netherlands, for example, uh, the government basically decided that uh, open access was going to be the way to go in the Netherlands for scientific publications. And that is the very interesting interplay that happens between politics, which has been lobbied, of course, by uh, uh, particular researchers, by also a lot of librarians to do changes, and then them taking uh, policy measures. And you see that happening uh, over uh, the, the, the following years also, uh, as well at the European level, as uh, in at the Dutch level, at the national level. And again, uh, organizations like, like LERU responding to that with uh, with uh, reports and policies. Uh, yeah, um, so I'm not gonna go into all of these, uh, these things, but uh, I, I would like to mention that uh, uh, having the European Union here and uh, them being very much focused on uh, open science, open access uh, yeah, um, has been an, an enormous impetus. Uh, and it also has helped, of course, that the European U Union also has a funding arm uh, which is the ERC, the European Research Council, where a lot of money uh, goes to uh, researchers that are funded for their research. And they have been putting also uh, uh, policies into place uh, to encourage, first of all, open access, but also then fair data, and then uh, yeah, moving forward to open science. Let's go to the next slide. 
So these are the eight pillars. Uh, I, I imagine these are all also known to everyone uh, yeah, that, uh, that the EU uh, has put forward. And I will delve in a number of them. Of course, Lee, I'm not going to delve into citizen science. You just had a, a very interesting uh, uh, presentations and conversation about that. But I'll go into that and I'll go especially into, of course, the role of, li of a library in all of these. Next slide. Um, so when we look at the national level, uh, yeah, uh, basically uh, the government in 2017, uh, which is still uh, the present government uh, in the Netherlands, said that open access was a government priority and that uh, open access and open science are the norm in scientific research. That is a very bold statement for a government uh, to make. And um, and that is also and that and again that is one of these things that happens when uh, uh, ultimately politics gets involved and says, well, yes, we believe in this, we are going to move forward to that, and it doesn't mean that then things change overnight, not at all. Uh, that is again that cultural change that needs to happen, but you do see. Uh, things that you, if you didn't have that political support, uh, that uh, wouldn't move along as as uh, as significantly as it is it is happening at this point. Next slide. Um, this is a. Uh, uh, these are the following are a few slides from the latest report from the Open Science, the European Open Science Policy Platform, that is basically an organization of uh, top researchers that is informing the European Commission on, uh, on their policy. And they've looked at a variety, uh, and so that reports from, sorry, this report is from April 2020, so just a few months ago. And they have looked at a variety of stakeholders and looked at where are they with regard to these eight different dimensions of open science. And um, first of all, what I'm already pleased with is research libraries are here clearly uh, uh, indicated as a stakeholder. That um, if you would have th uh, gone back 10, 10 years ago, this would not have been obvious. So it also means that research libraries have really uh, worked on this, have really uh, pulled their weight in order to make a number of things happen. And that is also recognized at the top level um, by researchers, by policymakers, that research libraries are one of the important stakeholders uh, besides uh, funding agencies, universities, obviously uh, researchers themselves, publishers, and so on and so forth. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, here you can uh, see, uh, and perhaps it's not uh, that clear, you can see again all of these uh, uh, stakeholders and we look at uh, uh, these are two of these pillars, rewards and incentives and indicators for, and next generation metrics. But we look at at what stage are we now? Are we at the discussion level, at the planning level, the implementation level, the adoption, or is this common practice? And so it's um, what they've done is done, uh, they talked to lots of people, they've done a number of surveys in order to, uh, to get this. And of course, it's not a very precise thing, but to give you a sense of where we are at. And uh, when we again look at libraries, I'm, I'm very happy to see that again, and we can go through the next slides also, uh, yeah, because there we see future of scholarly communication, where we see that libraries are really implementing the next, uh, the, yeah, the next steps of scholarly communication. We also see that the libraries are involved with the European Open Science Cloud. Uh, yeah, next slide, please. Uh, with fair data there, even we see that uh, libraries are again, uh, again, also uh, part in uh, with a number of other actors, part in the lead in adopting uh, standards and, uh, and, and, and uh, of fair data. Um, so we can see in all of these different uh, different pillars, libraries are, are involved. And that is something I'm very happy with that, that is also being noticed. Next slide, please. Again, uh, here we've seen a number, a few other things, skills and education, a very important one, of course. Again, libraries are already there at the adopting uh, phase and with citizen science, uh, we are also uh, participating in that. Next slide. So considering all of this context, these policy measures, these changes that are happening, 
what has been the impact for a academic library? And then again, I take the example of Leiden. First of all, I'm happy to say it just didn't happen to us. We made it happen. Libraries have been one of the leading actors for change. So it's not something that has just overcome us or has taken us by surprise. We have been part of that change. Uh, in Leiden itself, we already put that in our strategy document in, 20, uh, in 2011, where we wanted to develop new areas of expertise relating to text mining, data mining, uh, management of research data, and, 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 and things like that. And nevertheless, of, of, of course, uh, it has had an insignificant impact. We have created new types of positions. Uh, we have reallocated funding, uh, moving funding from one department to another. And we also have gotten, uh, that's very important to say, additional funding uh, from the university itself in order to be able to do these types of things, but also being able to um, get money from uh, uh, outside sources through project funding, through foundation funding, in order to be able to do a number of things. Uh, we've also seen an influx of staff with very new, uh, different qualifications, skills, uh, with a variety of non-library backgrounds, uh, uh, people who are specialists in, in indeed data mining, uh, who are uh, a specialist in uh, um, uh, research data. Uh, so these are very uh, new types of people who have come into the, the library environment. What we've also noticed has been not as, as easy to deal with is uh, we have different work cultures. The, the, the library work culture is not the same as a research work culture. And, um, and these people that are supporting these researchers uh, in all of these things, um, yeah, have to adapt themselves to that research work culture. And that is something uh, we, uh, we are dealing with and we are, we are um, uh, looking at very carefully to be able to, to, to manage that well, because that's not something that is, uh, you can just take for granted. Another thing that has really happened is a lot of collaboration. Uh, libraries are known to collaborate, but uh, we've collaborated with way more organizations at the university level than before. We collaborated, of course, with IT services and faculties, but to a much greater extent with academic affairs, with legal affairs, with human resource man management. Um, so, uh, so that has been a, 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 as well a learning, uh, a learning curve in order to do that, to get to know these people, uh, but also uh, a very enriching uh, experience. And that also, in fact, works uh, outside of the university on a national and international level. There is a lot of network activities going on, and uh, um, and that uh, has uh, is, is is has enriched our experience also. We have been developing best practices, something we as a library basically didn't really do that much because a lot of these processes that we have in place are being fine-tuned, traditional processes. But now we had to start up to completely new types of practices and we uh, are developing best practices, sharing best practices, learning from others. Um, also, what has been new in this whole development is that the library has done a lot of policy work for the university. Uh, something we we really didn't do uh, 20 years ago. We didn't do policy work. Uh, uh, now we are doing policy work on a variety of issues and basically we're involved in all of these uh, uh, open science dimensions, uh, sometimes as, as a, a being in the lead, but also uh, being consulted or uh, uh, advising on that. And of course, a lot of new services, consultancy, course development has taken place. We collaborate also in, on a different way, in a different way with researchers. Uh, we are now actively involved for applying for research funding together with the researchers, quite often adding uh, paragraphs on how uh, uh, one we, we will deal with uh, data management or how we are going to support uh, researchers or how we are going to uh, uh, do uh, course development. Uh, all of these things are added into research funding. Of course, the whole uh, um, uh, data management paragraph has to be filled in. Uh, yeah. And so the library uh, uh, is significantly involved in many of these open science dimensions. And also you see that, uh, that the university uh, and faculties and researchers 
look at the library and use also these new uh, expertise areas that, that the library has or its and its staff has. Next slide, please. Um, so what we have done uh, is we've set up a, a center for digital scholarship. I think that is not something unusual. A lot of uh, universities have, of university libraries have done that. And uh, so um, it's a separate department uh, at the university library. And there we deal with it, with all of the aspects of open access, open science, the research data, uh, virtual research environments. We look at the whole research uh, data life cycle we, do, uh, we give support for copyright, we run the institutional repository, the whole thing about IDs and ORCID IDs. Uh, yeah. What is also new is that we are now supplying management information to scientific directors about uh, what is the uptake on open access, how much money are we spending on open access, uh, how, ma how many uh, data files do we have, uh, are, uh, are they uh, fair, uh, all of these are, is uh, uh, management information that we supply on a uh, 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 twice a year uh, to the scientific directors at the university so that they know what is going on in this in this area. Um, we're also starting up a, a whole project on publication policy because we want to make sure that informed decisions are being made not only by scientific directors, but also by the researchers themselves about where they're going to publish, uh, um, whether that will require additional money, whether they fulfill also the requirements of funding agencies, uh, especially of course in Europe and also I think in other countries, Plan S uh, plays a major role in that. So that is something that uh, we uh, really have to uh, uh, give advice to. Uh, we, uh, the center also offers a lot of workshops and um, the challenges we still see is um, uh, just uh, making the publications available, making the data available is not enough for open science. It, one of the, the, the things that is, um, is at this point still not uh, well considered is for example, the software codes. Uh, um, a lot of researchers use of course software, they, they write special coding. Uh, uh, in order to be able to get to uh, to to do the the analysis of the data, and in fact we will get money next year to get also a specialist in that area in order to uh, see how we are going to deal with that, how we are going to preserve uh, the the coding so that also the research results, uh, the data can be uh, used to uh, to do peer review, but also to do checking of whether the right conclusions are being made uh, on the basis of that particular data. Another challenge that we still have to face is born digital materials and the long-term um, procuration of those. Uh, yeah, and that is something that we will start up uh, also in the next year. Next slide, please. Uh, well, this is just a few uh, 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 visual impressions of these types of courses that are taking place with PhD students, with uh, with faculty members on teaching them how to make uh, to do to write a data management plan or to make their data fair and these types of things. Next slide. So, as I mentioned, we have done a lot of policy support, uh, and also we've been. Uh, very much involved in a lot of university-wide projects, sometimes also just being the lead uh, of these projects. Uh, so um, uh, we, we were in the lead to write basically the, the data management policy of the university and also the open access policy. We've done a, uh, two years ago an ORCID, an ORCID implementation. Uh, ORCID is now also uh, obligatory for all of our researchers to, to have uh, yeah, so that we can use uh, all of the features of that uh, technology. Uh, one of the things that has changed in the Netherlands is that uh, uh, an addition has been made to the copyright law, which makes a lot of things possible in an open access, open science uh, environment. And so that had to be implemented. Uh, so we, that is something we have done uh, in uh, the last past year also. And the board has just now decided that um, that will also be part of uh, the um, um, 
of a um, um, the the work agreement that they have with scientists, with researchers at the university, that they have to use uh, that uh, that Taverna amendment that allows them to make their publications um, uh, available in uh, open access. Um, we are there is a university wide data management program going on. Uh, we are very heavily involved in that. We're also what we notice, of course is that in lots of organizations within the university, uh, they, are, they are doing all kinds of uh, research support for, uh, for researchers. And what has become a problem is that researchers don't know anymore where to go because they have to go to lots of places to get uh, advice on how to write a project proposal for research funding. Then they have to go somewhere else to get large uh, computing facilities. Then they have to come to the library in order to uh, have support on their data management plan or the verification of data. So what we are doing now is we are having a, a project where we want to bring all of this together, not in an organization, but in a virtual network so that there is one stop shopping for the researcher when they want research support. And so that is a, a very important project for the university. Next slide, please. So um, I will, uh, I'm also looking at the time. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll won't go into all of the, the eight in a, a very great detail, but again, what is the future of scholarly publishing? Well, we've done already a lot of open access with the negotiations with publishers. Um, uh, they are now standard that they include, in fact, open access publishing. Uh, so, uh, we are trying to uh, do it in such a way that our authors don't need to um, look at additional money uh, uh, to pay APCs, to pay uh, article processing charges. Uh, yeah. And so we are negotiating with publishers to basically do a transformation of, their, uh, of, their, of, of the license agreements, but also transformation of the journals. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, I've also included uh, uh, there a an overview from uh, the uh, center, uh, uh, the CWTS, which is a bibliographic center at the University of Leiden, and yeah, it's nice to see that uh, about seventy percent of our publications are now available in open access. The goal is this year one hundred percent, and we think we will get close to that since we uh, the. The Elsevier deal kicked in this year, so we, we think that will be a major impetus to move towards 85-90% uh, uh, of open access uh, for our um, peer-reviewed articles. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, well, we've set up a Leiden University Press, which also does a lot of open access publishing. We support uh, open access books through a variety of organizations, OAPEN, DOAP. We work with Knowledge Unlatched. Uh, so all of these um, uh, 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 organizations help us in order to support also making monographs, academic monographs available in uh, open access. Next slide, please. Now, what is coming up uh, in this area? Well, uh, Plan S has announced that they will come with a policy for open access academic monographs. I'm a bit nervous about that because that could be a major uh, yeah, chunk of money that would have to go to there. At Leiden, we publish, our authors publish about 200 academic monographs a year. And we talk about, an, about 10,000 euros per monograph. So that would be 2 million euros that would go into uh, uh, open access academic monographs. While for example, the book budget uh, of the library is 1 million euros to, to bring in all of the books uh, from all over the world. So um, two, mil 2 million for 200 books and 1 million to acquire the, the rest of the world. Well, that's why I'm nervous, of course, uh, but we'll see we're involved in those discussions. Um, we're doing transformative deals with publishers. Uh, that uh, is really also under the impetus of Plan S, basically uh, the idea is to flip the, the, uh, the, the journals into open access journals. We also see that a number of our universities are starting up university journals. There the question of course is, are these going to be journals that will have a, a sufficient level of quality 
and a sufficient level of peer review that uh, our authors will accept these as viable alternatives. Uh, yeah, I think that is a major question. Uh, yeah, we don't want these university journals to be the sort of um, uh, um, last resort for an, an author if uh, uh, he or she has been shopping around to publish an article and didn't succeed, that then the university journal would be uh, the outcome for that. Um, of course, also uh, small societies, especially in the humanities, are, uh, are now under pressure to convert their journals into open access journals. And we notice that they are really having problems with that because a lot of their um, association society income comes from these uh, journals. And they're not very expensive at all. It's, uh, they're, they're, they're very uh, essential, especially on a national level, because quite a lot of them is, are, are published in the local language. In the, uh, yeah. And so uh, we are also thinking at, at a national level to provide a journal infrastructure for these small societies uh, so that they can publish their um, their journals on these. So these are issues that are going to come up pretty soon next year in the, in the coming uh, couple of years. Uh, next slide, please. Fair data. Uh, yeah, um, uh, um, so uh, that is the, uh, the uh, to a certain extent, we know what needs to happen. But uh, the, two, the two first letters, findable and accessible, those are the easy parts. Um, the interoperable and the reusable, those are the real difficult ones. Uh, so that's where a, a lot of the work uh, still has to be done. And we are also not yet uh, certain uh, yeah, what the cost will be involved with really making these interoperable and reusable. Uh, yeah. So these are still uh, uh, very tough nuts to crack. Uh, yeah. And again, open data doesn't mean that uh, the data is fair. That is a, it's a very different level. You can make your data open, uh, but it can be t totally useless then, uh, although it is open. Uh, if you want to make it useful, it should be fair, uh, but it's not, it's not an easy, easy thing to do. Uh, next slide. Uh, so again, we, 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 are, we are working on that. We are working on the, on the infrastructure. We are collaborating as a library uh, in that area. Uh, yeah, and our data experts at the Center of Digital Scholarship are, are already supporting uh, researchers uh, uh, with that and are also training them in order to make uh, uh, data, uh, data fair uh, up to a certain point at this point, uh, to be, to be uh, honest about that. Next slide. European's Open Science Cloud. Um, of course, the Open uh, Science Cloud uh, the big bang for the European Open Science Cloud should happen next year. Then it should uh, uh, come into operation. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, it basically, the idea is that it is a, a common space, an integrated cloud environment for research data in Europe. But it doesn't mean that then if you have that and all your problems are solved, you need to do a lot at a local or national level in order to connect to this open science cloud and to really make use of that. Uh, so uh, that is something we are, uh, we are working on now on a national level. Uh, yeah, um, uh, and um, the, uh, the National Science Foundation is uh, offering also financial support in order to set up digital competence centers at the universities. Um, and, and our Center for Digital Scholarship will be a part of that digital competence center uh, yeah, in order to be able to, to do this. And there, there we still have to do quite a bit of work. Uh, so this is uh, 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 not quite pie in the sky, uh, but uh, it, it, the cloud still needs to be managed here, let's say. Uh, it needs to be uh, uh, really implemented and, and looked at and how we can connect to that. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, education and skills, an extremely important one. Uh, yeah, uh, we are doing a lot of work uh, at the university from the library, but also other centers. We have a center for data science. We have a center for digital humanities at the university. So they are doing a lot of work also. Uh, what we are now, uh, uh, yeah, uh, what we're now thinking about is how do we really integrate these open science skills in the general curriculum? 
uh, these are still very highly specialized uh, courses of, to a very targeted audience, researchers, PhD candidates, but how do we move that into the mainstream of the curriculum? And that is, is still, uh, that, uh, that is still in, in its very infancy uh, in order to do that. So a lot of courses are available, uh, but they are not really integrated in the, in the regular curriculum yet. And, and that is uh, really a, a, a next step that needs to take place. And we'll play a, a role in that as a library also. Next slide. Yes, uh, uh, probably one of the central uh, uh, points in op the open science dimensions is, well, um, uh, what's in it for the researcher? Uh, yeah, yeah, obviously, you could say, well, uh, 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 managing your data, that is a good thing in itself, but it does cost time, it does cost money, it does cost effort. Uh, researchers uh, are not used to do to do or most researchers let's say let's not generalize that but most researchers uh, specifically in humanities but even in the social sciences uh, are not used to doing this uh, yeah, um, uh, so what is in it for them we, uh, that has also uh, been in uh, taken up in the whole discussion in the Netherlands that we in fact are pushing researchers too far into uh, the kind of publish or perish uh, uh, situation. Uh, yeah. So all of this has been looked at at a national level of do we need to reconsider how we reward and how we incentivize researchers? And can we look at uh, different aspects of being a researcher? It's not just about research, it's also about teaching. Can we reward teaching more? Uh, can we come to a more balanced evaluation? And so up till now, basically, People who become professors at our universities, at our intensive research universities, are only those who do really well at research, who bring in uh, funding, external funding for research. And those who are not doing that, but might be very good teachers, are not being rewarded in such a way. So we're looking at a more balanced uh, uh, way in the Netherlands in order to deal with that. And we have now also set up a committee at Leiden to take this national report and think about how we can develop a new policy for that for our academics. Um, I've also suggested, and that will happen, to set up also a committee for support staff to think about this, because support staff in open science is going to be involved with research in a way that didn't happen that much before. So for example, people at our center for digital scholarship in the library are working with researchers, are co-publishing with researchers. And so we need to look in a different way to support staff um, uh, uh, in this new open science environment than, uh, how, than how we did that before. Uh, next slide, please. Then uh, next generation metrics, also very important because of course that's where rankings of universities, of uh, departments, of individual researchers come from. Uh, yeah, Leiden has been very much involved with that. That has been outside of the library because we have the CWTS, that uh, Bibliometric and also Science Policy Institute. And they have come up with the Leiden Manifesto for Research Metrics. I've put those 10 principles there in the, in the corner, uh, but uh, they've also worked on how to rethink uh, impact factors to move away from particular uh, uh, yeah, crude uh, uh, factors. And um, the uh, former director of the CW2S, who is now the Dean of Social Sciences, has been in the lead for a important EU report, uh, Indicator Frameworks for Fostering Open Knowledge Practice in Science and Scholarship, that has been published uh, uh, pretty, uh, yeah, few, also a few months ago. And uh, that really tries to create a framework of how um, uh, should you look in an open science and open knowledge environment to, to metrics and how uh, uh, do you, uh, how does, uh, uh, how can we uh, um, improve or in, encourage uh, uh, good quality in open science? Um, next slide, please. 
I'm, I'm going to, um, uh, yeah, scientific integrity, obviously very important. Open science hopefully will uh, also give a, a, a push in order to improve that so that, um, yeah, uh, uh, researchers who falsify their data or uh, uh, consciously make misinterpretations based on data or massage their data, which is a real problem. Uh, it's not uh, something that just uh, happens once in a while. Uh, it is an issue. Uh, a lot of the, the research cannot be replicated in particular fields. Um, so hopefully that will um, uh, uh, move us forward with that. But as a library, we're not heavily involved uh, with this. And then the final uh, uh, dimension, next slide, please. That is citizen science. Again, at Leiden, uh, we are involved with that in the library. We are, have done a number of uh, 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 crowd science projects involving uh, the crowd in um, uh, uh, doing uh, georeferencing, for example, on our digitized maps and these types of things. Uh, yeah, but you've discussed that, I think, uh, just, just now before. So let's move to the next slide. Now, uh, how are we going to f uh, move forward with uh, that cultural change? So we have appointed an open science ambassador at the university uh, yeah, in order to move this forward. Uh, yeah, there is a working group that supports uh, that ambassador. Uh, it includes myself, the University of Labyrinth, the head of the Center for Digital Scholarship and the Senior Policy Officer Research. And we are going to expand that group pretty, pretty soon. Uh, yeah, there is an open science multi-year plan that has been approved. And what is important is we work bottom up and top down. Uh, so bottom up uh, with researchers, we have a vibrant open science community in Leiden. I've given you the link there uh, of young researchers and also some, sometimes not so young researchers uh, yeah, who really think uh, open science is important and who are showing their research uh, yeah, and showing how they make that uh, available, how they uh, practice open science. But we're also working with academic leadership because if you don't bring along the top, the deans, the scientific directors, who might, who are quite often uh, of an older generation, uh, yeah, then uh, you don't want these uh, young uh, scientists to be stopped in their tracks doing this. So we're also working with the academic leadership in order to, to move forward with this. Um, again, uh, we are, uh, very good work is happening also in collaboration with Leru. Uh, there will be a new report coming out next month, at the end of next month, about implementing open science, which will be an important report uh, you know, from all of the research intensive universities that are a member of Leru. And we also work with a number of these uh, universities uh, to collaborate on really specific initiatives. Uh, you might have heard that the Dutch universities have um, made a deal with Elsevier where we are going to co-develop infrastructure that uh, will help us deal with open science, but infrastructure that uh, is going to be open and not closed as uh, uh, what, is, what is usually happening uh, with when uh, Elsevier does something like that. Uh, but uh, of course, we'll, we'll need to uh, look at this very carefully of the promises and also the agreement, the contract that has been made is, is, um, is uh, all of these specifics about openness are uh, taken up, uh, but this might be a very exciting uh, uh, development. Uh, uh, and we as a library are again, uh, very closely involved with that. Uh, next slide, please. Now, that these are my last, my last slides. Um, um, uh, when you look at open science, there are lots of things that we traditionally do as a library uh, outside of supporting open science and open access that we need to reconsider also. Um, uh, um, when we digitize our collections, um, we uh, don't tend to often make the high resolution images available. Well, I would say, let's start doing that. Let's start making these high res images available to everyone, to researchers, to the public, because these are exactly the images that are very useful in order to do research on. Uh, and also make these images, if it's possible, if there is no copyright uh, on it, make them public domain. Don't 
uh, uh, don't uh, keep uh, possession of these images, let uh, researchers use them in a variety of ways in their own research environments, make them available uh, to uh, as wide as possible. Also, uh, think about, and that of course should be linked open data, not open link data, linked open data. Uh, look at the possibilities there and make your metadata, your, uh, your thesauri available uh, through these technologies. And then the final one, and I want to uh, emphasize that one, is implement Triple uh, IF, the International Image Interoperability Framework. And that's going to be an enormous step forward in, um, in giving uh, researchers the tools to work with images, to annotate them, to compare them. Let's go to the next slide for that. The Triple uh, uh, IF uh, community uh, is uh, a growing number of really uh, important cultural heritage institutions major research libraries, museums, uh, archives, and, uh, um, and uh, they are, uh, have uh, put in uh, a lot of work uh, in order to uh, bring IIIF uh, in production. It is in production, it's all open source, anyone can use this, all of the software has been made. Um, so um, this is, is being widely adopted. And if you're not, have not, looked in that yet as a library, please do so, it's, it's very important. Let's go to the next slide. What does it do? It, it gives scholars really an, an amazing uh, new uh, possibilities to, uh, um, uh, um, to access image-based resources uh, in all of these, if, you, if you're of course using IIIF, in all of the silos that are out there uh, of uh, organizations in the world. It defines a set of common application programming uh, interfaces, supports interoperability, and uh, it has a whole set of shared technologies. That is for the people who have to do it, of course. Now, what's in it for the research? Let's go to the next slide. So it has really a lot of uh, possibilities in delivering images. You can manipulate the size, the scale, the region of interest, rotation, quality, and format of the image as a user. Um, you can start annotating uh, uh, images, you can comment on them, you can transcribe, you can draw on image-based resources. You can compare uh, pages, so you can compare different versions of manuscripts, you can build exhibits, virtual collections of these items, and you don't have to um, download these images for that. They stay at the servers on the different sides, but you bring them together through this technology. You can cite and share them. Um, so there is, uh, there is a lot uh, of possibility. There are a lot of possibilities for our researchers in order to finally use the, all of the things that we have been digitizing here over the years. Next slide. So this gives you an, an example of um, uh, uh, in, in Leiden, uh, this is the uh, La, Gali La Galigo uh, uh, manuscript. And uh, so that is available uh, through IIIF. Uh, 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 you can see uh, on the right-hand side of the screen at the bottom, the IIIF manifest. And further, uh, you can also see that there is a IIIF advanced viewer. And if we go to the next slide, you can see uh, um, that uh, the triple I viewer uh, can really zoom, but uh, that is just one of the, the, the minor, the minor uh, uh, um, uh, aspects of that viewer. You can do a lot more with that, uh, but I just want to focus your attention on that. Next slide, please. Uh, just a few URLs. Uh, yeah, uh, by the way, that is the University Library of Leiden on a sunnier day than today. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, and I and the next slide. Uh, thank you for your attention, and uh, yeah, uh, I am uh, open to questions, discussion, whatever you have planned. Thank you so much, Kurt. Mari kita semuanya beri tepuk tangan yang meriah untuk Kurt. That was an incredibly rich and meaty presentation, and thank you so much for that. I learned so much. If you don't mind, I'm just going to um, summarize just quite briefly in Indonesian for okay. everyone to hear. Okay. All right. Did he, um, admittedly, I, I just a disclaimer, I don't think I can summarize 
all of that in a succinct way, but I'll do my very best. And it's a note right. to everyone that the slides are available. Um, the operators will be able to, if they haven't already, the operators will be able to put the link in the chat so everybody can access the slides. Jadi tadi Kurt membahas, menurut saya inti sarinya adalah uh, the role of libraries dalam membuat perubahan ke open science. Dari segi policy-nya, dari segi pendidikan ke student-studentnya, dari segi uh, apa, mengecek datanya apakah fair dan fair dan open data itu cukup berbeda. <coughs> Jadi ini suatu studi kasus yang cukup baik. Selama ini kita pikir bahwa open science itu mungkin dari segi penelitinya, mungkin dari segi universitasnya, tapi itu adalah salah satu contoh yang luar biasa di mana library dan perpustakaan bisa turut ikut campur dengan dan membuat perubahan yang cukup substansial. Jadi silakan komisioner mau baca lagi saya um, komisioner saya sama responnya mungkin kita kehabisan waktu jadi silakan dibaca lagi slide-nya. Um, so I'd like to go into a few questions. Um, you you the took first question. way less time than me to to give the uh, the the summary of the presentation. So thank you so much uh, you for that. Just, just a disclaimer. A lot of the summary that I said was, oh, this is so great. There's at some points, please read the slides. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But incredible, I absolutely enjoyed it. And um, we still have Alison as well as Dr. Premkar Kaus with us, and I'm hoping that we can talk a little bit more. So the first question that I want to ask is, we're going to ask a question that's directly relevant to Kurt's one, and then uh, Alison, I know that you, you have a few time constraints, so then I'm going to defer to you in the next question, but then we'll go into a more general discussion. So. In the question and answer, we have two questions by Dr. Dasapta Erwin. The first question is, with the advancements of libraries in Leiden University and at a national level, what's the role of giant commercial publishers to Leiden and at a national level, especially when the products are now not only limited to journals or books publishings? And um, Dr. Dasapta cites, do governments still need to make a one nation, one subscription deal like we're currently seeing in India. I know that you touched on how you're negotiating with Elsevier. Um, perhaps you could elaborate a little bit more because I think a lot from the open science community as well as in Indonesia where we may not be a well resource, getting access to the papers is has become a, a very, very large challenge. And, and tuning on for that, I realize it's quite long, but you can read it in the question and answer that the deal with Elsevier, the percentage of open access publications is targeted to be 98%. And the question goes, I thought Leiden would pick the cheaper way or by simply making an agreement, for instance, the directory of open access journals or other non-profit publishers. So what's your take on this, Kurt? Well, um, we, we still uh, we still think that commercial publishers or academic publishers, uh, talking about Oxford University Press and others, uh, yeah, are still important. Uh, yeah, um, um, uh, they are important to our researchers for, again, the uh, the credit they get uh, from publishing in in journals that uh, are very uh, competitive with regard to the acceptance rates uh, that they have uh, for uh, for uh, for articles. Of course, this, as I, as I mentioned, with also rethinking rewards and incentives, might might change uh, that uh, also with rethinking metrics if. Um, if you're looking more to what is really the, the, the inherent quality or the impact of a particular article uh, um, instead of what is the uh, uh, a particular uh, uh, factor, uh, age factor or whatever uh, of the article, that that obviously might change in, 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 the, in the coming years. But at this point, we still feel that, and we know we hear that from our researchers, that they are still very much committed to uh, the existing journals. So our, our, our policy in the Netherlands has been to work with these, uh, with these publishers and to try to move them towards flipping these journals uh, to, uh, to open access. Now, we can't say that that has um, worked for everything. Uh, we see that publishers are, are extremely smart and savvy. Uh, yeah. So it's not like the, the idea that before uh, that some people had, oh, with open access, everything is going to become so much cheaper. On the contrary, open access is more expensive. Uh, yeah. so, um, so we uh, are betting on a number of different horses, let's say. So we're working with the publishers in order to make that switch, to make that transformation. But as I mentioned, uh, there are a number of uh, institutions that are also looking at 
university journals um, uh, uh, in order to uh, perhaps make that change. It will really depend, I think, on the culture that uh, universities have, that funding agencies have, that ranking uh, organizations have, and that researchers have um, in order to, to, to see whether they, um, where, uh, a number of other things are important except for the, the high credit that is uh, attached to a particular publisher or a particular journal. Uh, yeah, and that you look more at what is the, what is the, the quality of an individual article uh, uh, and, uh, and less where, where it has been published. If that is a change that will happen, I really don't know. Uh, yeah, um, uh, but at this point, I think we're still um, uh, working with uh, commercial publishers. Uh, for your national uh, level agreement, uh, our agreements are with um, all of the universities of, of the Netherlands. That's how we do the agreements. We're looking at uh, or exploring possibilities for a national agreement where all of the, uh, yeah, the, the, basically the whole country uh, uh, could benefit from this. Again, they do have access, everyone, all of these open uh, articles, access articles are available worldwide in open access, so that's not an issue. But uh, yeah, the deal is basically for taking away the APCs. And so that has been done for universities now for a number of our, uh, uh, we pay for it in a different, uh, in the, through the one-time license fee. Uh, yeah. But uh, other research organizations still have to pay APCs. Um, we know uh, that doing that on a national level in the Netherlands is very difficult. It's not something that the government is willing to step into. Uh, yeah. These discussions are going on, but I don't expect that this will happen anytime soon. Mm. No worries. Thank you so much for that answer, Kurt. Now, um, unfortunately, Alison, we know that you have to head off in a few minutes, so I would love to just give you the last few minutes. Do you have any last parting remarks, um, especially for a country that's trying to get into citizen science and we're trying to engage stakeholders and people to be um, to get people excited about it? What last words would you like to leave us for this conference today? Thank you, Masoni. Um, I've, you know, just again been really inspired by uh, our discussion here today, and I can't wait to to hear more what comes out of uh, out of this session and the paper uh, sessions later on today. Um, I also look forward to staying in touch. Uh, with you, uh, with our other presenters, um, and with participants who may have uh, who may have submitted questions that we didn't get to yet, uh, I did provide my contact information in my presentation, um, or you can you can reach out to uh, Mas, Chao, Mas Chao and others, um, and let's keep that conversation going. Um, but yeah, I think just overall. We have touched on some of the very uh, diverse and numerous resources, success stories, um, and kind of pitfalls to avoid as well uh, in, um, in setting up and carrying out uh, crowdsourcing and citizen science initiatives of all sizes and all scopes. Um, this is, I think, just the tip of the iceberg, Punchak Gunung S. Um, but I'm really glad that there is such a forum uh, as this one um, to, to bring together folks that are really passionate about growing citizen science. Um, so yeah, and I think, and I, I think my, you know, my, uh, my co-presenters here today have raised you know, so many good points, perhaps much more eloquently than I could, but um, just very happy to be here. Thank you again. No worries, Allison. And just before you go, I would love for the four of us at least to take a picture first, uh, just to commemorate this lovely event. Maschayo, are the sure. operators? Uh, would you be able to join in? Yeah, Atau mungkin bisa tolong ambil fotonya? Saya ambilin fotonya saja ya. Huh. Okay, silakan dihitung ya, Mas. Yep, satu, one, two. Yeah, once again, one, two. Yeah, thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Maschayo. Thank you so much, Allison, for being with us today. And yeah, we hope you have a great one. Talk to likewise, you likewise. Tit hap sehat semua, ya? Thank you, Alison. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Great. No worries. So the next question um, that I have, I'd like to direct to Dr. Premker Kraus. And this is an interesting question because this is by Sharifatul Mubarak. Um, 
But Sharifatul, would you like to ask this question live? Or would you like me to? Apakah mau saya yang 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 kasih pertanyaan atau Mbak mau tanya sendiri? Gimana? Sorry, just give us one minute. Okay. Um, that's okay. I think I'll ask the question. So, the question is how to encourage citizen science in an environment with low science literacy. And the question is is there any possibility that in the other side this might promote more pseudoscience in society? As in like I think the question is that talking about okay, how do we do this in a sensitive way that we can promote citizen science? Um, and are there any potential of un, are there any potential unwanted effects? Um, because I think one of the issues in Indonesia is that since science isn't necessarily one of the strong pillars that we hold in our society, there's a lot and a lot of pseudoscience going around. Um, so I guess, uh, yeah, the question is how do you encourage citizen science with low scientific literacy? And do you see any potential pitfalls or effects, or how do you think it might affect how citizens actually perceive science? Sorry, doctor, your, your volume is very small. Um, can't seem to hear you. The, the connection was uh, just uh, interrupted. Could you please repeat the last question, please? Sure, no worries. Um, in addition to that, I, the, the volume is still very, very small. I'll repeat the question. Um, so how to encourage citizen science in a society where there's low scientific literacy? And do you think by encouraging citizen science, it might actually affect how people see science in general? Because, um, so I'm rephrasing the question a little bit, um, because in Indonesia, there's lots and lots of pseudoscience actually going around in society. Yeah, um, interesting question. Uh, it is, it is um, really difficult to, differentiate um, this um, um, this literature and um, which is um, and I, I think um, the the important point is um, that we uh, look uh, for always for uh, uh, the the quality of the papers uh, to do the peer review and um, that we um, and a good um, um, indicator is um, are the uh, citations for example if I um, understand the questions right um, so maybe um yes maybe quotes the bella will uh, also add uh, something to this question um sorry just a little bit of clarification sorry i might have phrased it a little bit wrong it's more that say if i'm going to rural indonesia where there's a lot of mysticism there's a lot of pseudoscience being believed how do i how can i engage those people into participating in citizen science how would i be able to frame the question do you think yeah. unless i'm perfectly happy to move on to another question if you'd like yes yes Please, yes. Yeah, that's no problems at all. So there's another question here, and I think this is directed to you, Doctor. Um, what is the role? Somebody just wanted a bit more elaboration. What's the role of the ESCA, and what kind of activities do they do? It's for me the question, or the. E I think so. Okay. Um, uh, you mean yeah. the EXA or the European? Uh, citizen Science Association. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, it's it's uh, like an umbrella organization of the citizen science uh, networks and um, in uh, all countries in in Europe, and they uh, contribute to uh, building a strong citizen science community, 
and um, they provide to um, uh, to develop high quality standards and tools uh, and training materials for um, uh, citizen science practitioners, for example, and they are also um, involved in uh, a lot of cit European citizen science projects and um, they organize a lot of uh, international and European conferences uh, dealing with um, all stuff of citizen science and they um, pre try to provide a legal framework um, for um, uh, the citizen science um, Yes, uh, practitioners, and um, this, this are mainly the main tasks of this um, uh, organization, an umbrella organization. Okay, thank you so much. That's wonderful because I think that a lot of the people's minds, um, especially listening to some of the earlier talks, so Kurt, a lot of the earlier topics was about citizen science and getting people involved in sort of environmental sciences. And the big question in everyone's mind is how? How are we going to implement that in our society, in the current Indonesian context? And thank you for the answer, uh, Dr. Primka Kraus, because I think for a lot of people, they're thinking, okay, what sort of infrastructure needs to be in place to roll this out on a national level? And so I'm going through the question. Um, and I'm mindful that we're, we're quite short on time. It's, it's, it's just blown through very, very quickly. And I think one of the things that I would love for us to do before I summarize and close off is just to get some closing remarks from the both of you. Currently in Indonesia, um, open science, we've been around for a while, but it, it's an uphill battle for many years. Citizen science as well. And in a lot of places, as I said before, we may not have the infrastructure. Sometimes government on the highest level may not have buy-in for either citizen science or open science, where a lot of the, we see some wonderful work at LIPI, but maybe at the top, it's, it's a bit more difficult to get there because especially policy making is heavily politicized. Um, universities are prioritizing rank over anything else and therefore produce incredible science and involving citizens may not be at the top of those lists. For all of us here, we're fighting, we're doing our very best. Um, could you just give a few minutes each of, what are your last remarks for us? What could you, what could you encourage us with? Um, Kurt, would you like to go first? Uh, sure. Uh, yeah. Well, um, I think, of course, uh, involving uh, citizens in citizen science is not just in Indonesia, uh, um, uh, an issue that we have to grapple with. Uh, and uh, unscientific thinking is not, uh, um, uh, we see that coming up worldwide. Just look at United States, just look also at uh, in Europe, uh, especially with COVID. Uh, yeah, there is a lot of unscientific thinking going on in lots of uh, populations. So that is not a, a, a thing that is uh, only happening in, Indone in Indonesia. Uh, yeah, um, um, bringing uh, the the public uh, and involving the public in uh, in uh, uh, open science and in science experiments is um, something that yeah we hope of course that one will learn about the whole scientific process. That scientific process doesn't proc the process doesn't necessarily uh, give you uh, the final answer. It is a trajectory of experimenting, uh, uh, clarifying one's thinking, reconsidering one's thinking, coming up with new questions. And that I think one of the, uh, the, the, the major targets of uh, citizen science is that one uh, understands that scientific pro, uh, pro, uh, process, uh, that one understands how science works. And of course, one of the discouraging things that has happened, of course, is that with when we saw at the start of the, uh, the COVID, a pandemic, there was quite a bit of trust in uh, science. Uh, and again, there are exceptions. Uh, let's look at the United States, for example, uh, that has not been uh, a leading shining light uh, in this uh, at this point. Uh, but the the uh, the public has had quite a bit of trust at the early beginnings in uh, uh, the scientists' um, ideas about how to deal with this pandemic. But again, what we see now is that that trust is, uh, is diminishing because one realizes that uh, science doesn't have the ultimate answers. We uh, scientists have to learn also about this. They might have come have certain views and have to rethink these views and come to different conclusions. 
And uh, so it is also fraught with possible um, opening the black box, let's say, of science also shows you how a sausage is being made in the, the meat factory. Uh, yeah. And that could also, of course, diminish the respect one might have for science. But I think ultimately it is something, if people understand that continuing to ask questions, to continuing to refine insights, that that is the whole process and to also challenge ideas and to basically say, well, we were wrong then and we know now better. That is the whole uh, purpose of science and it's how science works. And hopefully by understanding that, uh, one will uh, be able to understand also uh, how uh, and uh, that insights of science are perhaps temporary insights and that it's a whole a part of a trajectory. And if, if people understand that, I think then we will have come already, uh, 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 we have already made a serious step forward. Thank you so much, Kurt. That's absolutely wonderful. Dr. Franka Kross, what words would you like to leave us with? Sorry, I think you might still be on mute. Sorry, sorry. Uh, citizen science um, could be developed as uh, uh, like a brand and it takes um, um, time to build um, networks um, with all stakeholders and to involve um, um, all st stakeholders in the citizen science and open science um, context and um, um, education is an important uh, factor uh, to um, to um, uh, transport uh, citizen science uh, tools uh, in in schools, for example, um, then we in our com community uh, network we have uh, a lot um, 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 se sensi uh, a lot of um, to do with uh, to uh, to sensitizing politicians to, to sensitizing policy makers uh, so policy work is an important step and um, politicians policy policy makers must be taken along at all levels at the uh, local up to the um, national levels and um, finally um, yeah it is important to rem um, remember um, um, permanent that um, infrastructures have to build. Um, so this is, uh, there are uh, some of um, yeah, items which are very important uh, to, to uh, for the citizen science um, as, uh, as a topic for, for research and um, uh, um, uh, um, society. Thank you very much. So if I can just summarize that very quickly, it sounds to me that number one, this change is going to take time. We're going to have to engage with stakeholders and policymakers all the way from local up to national levels. And it's important that we start in many different areas. Like I love that you talked about schools. Imagine young children being able to say, hey, I collected data for a national wide program and, and so on and so forth. And building on from that, what Kurt said, by getting people engaged with the scientific process, both its good parts and maybe some of its flaws might actually increase trust in science in the long run and might have downstream effects where in the future we might be able to involve more science in our policy make in our policy making. I'll just quickly summarize that in Indonesian. Um, practice ini, ini membangun budaya yang baru. Jadi kita harus mulai dari berbagai tingkat. Kita mulai dari tingkat lokal sampai tingkat nasional. Dan kita bisa inf dan kita harus menggandeng dan involve policy maker sebisanya. Soalnya mereka yang menentukan kita arahnya kemana. Setelah itu, kita harus coba hal baru. Contohnya kita bisa meng menggandeng anak sekolahan. Bayangin anak sekolahan bisa ikut mengukuhkan data untuk proyek nasional. Itu bagi mereka bisa suatu hal yang luar biasa. Dan saat mereka belajar lebih banyak tentang science, itu akan Meskipun ada ada flawsnya, meskipun ada kekurangan di bagaimana kita lakukan sains pada hari ini, itu jangka panjangnya bisa meningkatkan kepercayaan mereka terhadap sains. Dan mungkin satu hari di depan kita bisa lebih integrate sains dengan policy making kita. 
So I just wanted to say an incredible thank you to both Kurt and Dr. Bram Kakas, who's got up in early hours in the morning to speak to us here in Indonesia. I thoroughly enjoyed moderating this event, and it's an incredible pleasure. And I'm going to hand it back to the MC. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for our moderator, Mr. Dr. Sanderson Oni, to let the first session. Our Maaf, ke mute, Mbak, sepertinya. Iya, karena tiba-tiba uh, microphone saya termit, mohon maaf. Oke, okay. uh, our greetings as well for Mrs. Ala, Mr. Cross, and Mr. Kurt for your very insightful uh, presentation. Uh, I think it is really interesting to get to know that the uh, citizen, they could uh, be participated in uh, collaboration with the institution as well to develop the science itself. Okay, uh, now then we are approaching to the next session that is call for papers. The call for papers session will be starting about 15 minutes and just like yesterday, uh, it is divided into two different webinar rooms. There will be room A and room B, and the committee, the committee will give the information on the group chat. Okay. And before we get into the call for paper session, there will be a time uh, for break, just for 15 minutes. And also we can remind to all the participants to respond to our questionnaire. There will be two questionnaires. The first one is the session evaluation and the EKM as well. Uh, please be noticed that only use the same name and email address that you have used to fill in the registration because we will only produce a certificate for those who has matched the information provided. And also, don't forget that filling in the IKM questionnaire and the session evaluation questionnaire is the requirement to having the certificate. Uh, Bapak dan Ibu yang kami hormati, para partisipan, mohon uh, di, dapat diperhatikan untuk pengisian kuesioner evaluasi kegiatan serta kuesioner untuk IKM karena keduanya merupakan salah satu prasyarat, prasyarat untuk memperoleh sertifikat kegiatan uh, dan jangan lupa untuk juga mempergunakan nama dan email address yang sama dengan yang Anda pergunakan di saat melakukan registrasi. Oke, okay, ladies and gentlemen, before we have some time for take a break, please now we have a first session to in closing this uh, first session for the conference today. Before that, on behalf of the event committee, uh, we say thank you for all of your attention, attention and stay safe and healthy everyone. For the committee, please just assist to take a photo session all together. Okay. One, two. One, two. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kurt. Thank you. Thank you. Mas, yeah, Mr. Thank you. Kurt, thank you. Mr. Cross and Dr. Sanders Sami. Thank, thank you, everyone. See you in the call for paper session. Okay. Thank you. Stay safe and healthy, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye bye. All the best. Bye bye. Bye.
Ini ini timnya mama. Mm -hmm.